أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الأخ الله يوم إذ بعضهم لبعض عدو بعضهم لبعض عدو إلا المتقين يا عباد لا خوف عليكم اليوم ولا أنتم تحزنون الذين آمنوا بآياتنا وكانوا مسلمين ادخلوا الجنة أنتم وأزواجكم تحبرون يطاف عليهم بصحاف من ذهب وأكواب وفيها ما تشتهيه الأنفس وتلذ الأعين وأنتم فيها خالدون وتلك الجنة التي أورثتموها بما كنتم تعملون لكم فيها فاكهة كثيرة منها تأكلون إن المجرمين في عذاب جهنم خالدون لا يفتح تر عنهم وهم فيه مبلسون وما ظلمناهم ولكن كانوا هم الظالمين ونادوا يا مالك ليقض علينا ربك قال إنكم ماكثون لقد جئناكم بالحق ولكن أكثركم للحق كارهون أم أبرموا أمرا فإنا مبرمون أم يحسبون أنا لا نسمع سرهم ونجواهم بلى ورسلنا لديهم يكتبون قل إن كان للرحمن ولد فأنا أول العابدين سبحان رب السماوات والأرض رب العرش عما يصفون فذرهم يخوضوا ويلعبوا حتى حتى يلاقوا يومهم الذي يوعدون وهو الذي في السماء إله وفي الأرض إله وهو الحكيم العليم وتبارك الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض وما بينهما وعنده علم الساعة وعنده علم الساعة وإليه ترجعون صدق الله العظيم What are they waiting for? But the hour to come upon them suddenly when they are not expecting it on that day the closest friends will be enemies to one another except for the God-fearing My servants you will feel no fear today. You will know no sorrow. As for those who believe in our signs and become Muslims, enter the garden, you and your wives, delighting in your joy. Platters and cups of gold will be passed around among them, and they will have their, all their heart's desires and all their eyes find delight in. You will remain in it timelessly forever. That is the garden you will inherit for what you did. There will be many fruits in it for you to eat. The evildoers will remain timelessly forever in the punishment of hell. It will not be eased for them. They will be crushed by their despair. We have not wronged them. It was they who were wrongdoers. They call out, Malik, let your Lord put an end to us. He will say, you will stay the way you are. 
We brought you the truth, but most of you hated the truth. Or have they hatched a plot? It is we who are plotters? Or do they imagine that we do not hear their secrets and their private talk? On the contrary, our messengers are right there with them, writing it down. Say, if the all-merciful had a son, I would be the first to worship him. Glory be to the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the Lord of the throne, beyond what they describe. So leave them to plunge and play around until they meet their day which they are promised. It is he who is God in heaven and God on earth. He is the all-wise, the all-knowing. Blessed be him to whom belongs the sovereignty of heavens and the earth and everything in between them. The knowledge of the hour is with him. You will be returned to him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I realize you're waiting for Sheikh Omar. <laughs> but Sheikh Omar asked that I come up here and talk, and so here I am, inshallah. Sheikh Omar, as you know, is our director at the Yaqeen Institute, in which I'm a fellow. And alhamdulillah, I've really had a wonderful opportunity to share a lot of the research and work that we do. Speaking of that research and work, I'd like to take you, inshallah, today on a journey that's a little bit of my own journey. It's a journey from about 10 years ago now in which we were working on, personally for me, a personal journey on this topic of mental well-being. We're just emerging out of a pandemic, and for those who have not been really tuned in to the discussion on mental health and mental wellness, I think you are now, mashallah. <laughs> for me though, as a product of my own community, and like many of you, held a lot of stigmas and internalized discomforts related to this field of psychology or psychiatry and such, and so I'm going to share with you a story in which I am at the tail end of my training at Stanford University where I did my psychiatry training. And my work, for those of you who know prior to my story, prior to this, is that I am a teacher of the deen, alhamdulillah, somebody who has studied for many years. In fact, that room right there is where we have our woman's halakha every single Friday night with the Rahma Foundation here at the MCC. Before there was really this carpeting in the MCC and before programs really even took place here at the MCC, the women were here, the Rahma Foundation were here, was here, the girls were here doing their work, alhamdulillah. I share with you the story in which I was reviewing manuscripts. Having studied the Sharia, we study the traditional texts, the old texts, seventh, eighth, ninth century texts, our Turath. And for me, my journey, my interest in this was where does the Muslims fit in the story of mental health? Because we have so many taboos and stigmas in our community about this topic. Is there a connection at all? As I was reading, one of the texts that I came across was a lesser known scholar from the ninth century. He's somebody that I didn't really know anything about, or it's not a name that you would recognize right away, like some of the famous scholars or physicians of our Muslim heritage. As I was reading his books, I was really struck. Each of the chapters in which he was writing, it seemed to me as someone who was newly trained as a psychiatrist, was talking about depression, anxiety, even obsessive compulsive disorder, what we would call OCD. It blew me away. Because what we had studied in school and in my training program at the most prestigious universities said, that illnesses like OCD were modern illnesses, only discovered in the 19th century, fully classified and diagnosed, and they were only conditions that were found in Europe, typically by white psychologists. But here I was reading a text from the 19th, from the 9th century, not the 19th century, a millennium earlier. And what I saw there really struck me. Down the hall from my office was the preeminent scholar on OCD in the country. He was at Stanford. And the person who wrote all the textbooks on this topic. I finally mustered enough courage <laughs> to walk down the hall and knock on his door. And I said, 
I think I found something here that shows that OCD is actually discovered much earlier than what's written in the books and that we study in our programs. And he said, no, 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 no. Very nice guy, but he said, I'm a history buff. And he starts pulling off papers that he published from his shelf. He said, here are the Romans, and here are the Greeks, and here's this, and here's this. There is no evidence that this was discovered prior. And I said to him, what now was the famous question, but can you read in Arabic? <laughs> and he said, no. Can you? I said, yes. And he did what every professor does. Fine. Go translate it and come back. <laughs> I said, OK. Sat down and diligently translated that chapter and came back and presented it to him side by side. The criteria we today use as psychiatrists in the DSM are manual for diagnosis. And al-Balkhi, this is the name of the scholar from the ninth century, Abu Zayd al-Balkhi, his criteria that he used. And when you look what's now published in the paper, line by line by line by line, he had figured out the correct classification, diagnosis, and treatment for this illness in the ninth century. This professor, who otherwise was kind of hand-waving, started jumping jumping in my office, jumping. And he said to me, you must publish. I wasn't thinking of publishing. This was a personal journey, personal reading. And so we did. You could read it today in the Journal of Affective Disorders. And we then published another paper on Belchi and his discovery of phobias and his correct treatment of it. Now here's the thing. That particular journal that we submitted it to, the Journal of Anxiety Disorders, said to us, they wrote back, because it's a double-blinded peer review process as they do in scientific and academic writing, said to us, what you're claiming is unorthodox. You're trying to rewrite the history of psychology. And we said, yes, <laughs> precisely. And they said, well, we need historians of medicine to read this over and to verify what you're saying, your claims. We said, fine. They took many, many, many months finding these historians of medicine. When the review came back, it's double-blinded. They don't know who I am or what institution I'm from or anything. What they see, and this is where you know the bias in academic medicine, they called me a he, okay. <laughs> discovered what is written here, they said, rewrites history. It rewrites the narrative that is usually very Eurocentric. It rewrites a narrative in which we feel that we are excluded from this discussion of psychiatry or doesn't belong to us, when in reality we have an incredible history related to this field. But it doesn't stop there. That's only the starting point. Because then the question became, what is it that inspired the likes of Al-Balkhi and Ar-Razi and Ibn Sina and the rest to do this work? Was it just writing and theory? Or did they do something with this? And where did they get their inspiration? This is where I draw you to their writings, where they quote the hadith of the Prophet And they say that their inspiration is the hadith of the Prophet in which he says that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to send down an illness to humanity, he would also send its cure. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَضَعْ دَاءً إِلَّا وَوَضَعَ لَهُ شِفَاءً أو كما قال دواء either an illness, if we're an illness, either a cure or a treatment. And that matches, matches modern medicine, where some things we have treatments and some things we have cures. SubhanAllah, it doesn't stop there. That then led to a long discovery, and in fact, the creation of my lab at Stanford called the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. The first of its like in the country, alhamdulillah, maybe the world. But the point is, in the work that we do, on research of Muslims in mental health, some of which is now published with Yaqeen, partnered with them. Some of the work that we have found is that these scholars didn't just write theory, they took theory into practice. This last year, my lab interns and I have been working on a book, and the book is about the institutions of healing that the Muslims created. You see something very special happened when you understand that Islam 
is a holistic religion that talks about mind, body, and soul together, intertwined, and you never separate these out. Then you can understand that why their healing centers and treatment centers are connected, all of them together. Today, modern medicine feels very segmented. Healing feels very segmented. Literally, we say, the literature says, psychology, quote, lost its soul. It literally did, even though early on that was the point of studying psychology. Today, subhanAllah, we have something that we need to do as the modern Muslims in this community that have a lot of wonderful opportunities. I think it's high time that we actually do a revival of our own tradition, that we know it, understand it, read it, but also revive it. Let me tell you what these scholars did. This last year, hopping around from Cairo to Istanbul to different countries across the world, looking at these healing institutions. Those of you who speak Farsi or Urdu, you know the word bimar, yes? Illness. You know the word stan, location. The Bimaristan was literally the location, the healing centers for illness that the Muslims created. Those of you who speak Arabic, you understand Dar al-Shifa, the abode or center of healing. This is what Muslims called their hospitals. Their hospitals were not like modern day hospitals today, very sterile and very kind of hard to really access and you don't feel a real sense of healing. Many people are scared of hospitals. Their healing centers were in the middle of nature. Their healing centers had the beautiful Islamic architecture that you would expect, the beautiful symmetry. They incorporated in it sound, aromatherapy, smell, colors, fountains, greenery. And the treatment team, if you look at it, is interdisciplinary. It wasn't just doctors and nurses but they also had what today we would call social workers, taking care of what the needs of the patients were day to day. They also had the dietitian and the pharmacist making medications. And they had the religious scholar, the imam, the person who today we would call a hospital chaplain. All of this care team rotated together on each and every patient every morning to see how they were doing. And all of this was supported by the waqf, the endowments. People who wanted their legacy, their sadaqa jariya, their ongoing charity to be helping others who were ill because of the sunnah of treating and visiting the ill. Let me tell you what else. Our research is showing something very special. Today you can still walk into some of the maristans and be maristan is shortened into Latin to maristan. Now you know the connection. When you look at the Madistans across the Muslim world, you'll see something very special. You'll see that it spans the entire region of Islam, everywhere Islam went. You're familiar with the Masajid, the houses of Allah where we pray. You're familiar with the importance of education. So the Madaris, the Madrasa, the educational system, everywhere Islam went. But are you familiar with the Madistans? that everywhere Islam went, it had healing institutions that they built. From the tip of Africa, all the way into North Africa, whether you're in Egypt or whether you're in Turkey or whether you're up in Bosnia or Uzbekistan or over in Spain, or whether you're all the way in the far regions in India and in Iran. Maristans were everywhere that Muslims had. Why am I pressing this point? When you enter into the Maristan, what you find is a section on surgery, a ward on surgery, a ward or section for internal medicine, your internal organs, a section for ear, nose, and throat, and a section on psychiatry. Did you know this? Did you know that Muslims were the first in human history to our research, Wallahu ta'ala alam, were the first to put in institutions of psychiatric treatment in their hospitals. Why am I saying this? Part of this is our stigma, our lack of information, our lack of knowledge on our own heritage. Sisters and brothers, as I close here, I want to tell you something. I have a call to you because I received a call yesterday and it was a call from some folks on the East Coast, just yesterday. And they said to me, we have purchased 10 acres 
beautiful land with a creek running through it and some buildable areas. Will you come build us a Madistan? And I said to them, Inshallah, but where is my community? Where is my people? Those of you who have been attending the halakas in that room right there, week in and week out, every year since this building existed. Those of you who have been here and had your daughters go through our Rahma programs and have graduated and become teachers and come back and teach in our programs. Your women and your girls and our men and boys that have benefited from these programs. Where are you? It's my ask for you. Today, inshallah, after Sheikh Omar's program, we have a second program that's on mental health. We have our panels that is coming, our Muslim therapists that are coming to talk about mental health and to answer your questions. In between, there'll be the halal food trucks, so please stay, inshallah. And the table is in the back there, the Madistan table that I want you to stop at. I want to call out for those who want to support this Waqf and Endowment project. I want to call to the architects, to the designers. I want to call to those who are the entrepreneurs and the business people. I want to call out to the real estate people. I need to call out to this community to help us literally revive the modern day version of the Madistan, holding in the entire heritage of the Muslim past, understanding the beauty that it had, that holistic healing of mind, body, soul, not disconnected from each other, but also bridging it to modern science application and research, which alhamdulillah, our lab is able to do. So I pray inshallah with that, that it inspires you. Come see us at the table, come talk to us inshallah. And one more last thing, Brother Muni kind of stole my thunder a little bit. But we're also announcing today a momentous day, alhamdulillah. Yes, Sheikh Ahmad is here, yes. <laughs> but incredibly momentous in that we are opening the grand opening, inshallah, of the first Bay Area based, because we're born here and plan to stay here, inshallah, office of Madistan. Alhamdulillah. 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 Thank you. Please talk with us and come visit us. We'll actually be showing the office in Shalats in this building at MMCC and amazing partners to us. And let us take that first step in the right direction to actually building full on Madistans in Shalat Ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Takbir. Jazakallah khair. So we are now, I'm going to now turn it over to the able hands of uh, Sheikh Abdullah Wahid. He is the MIFTA Institute co-founder, and he will introduce um, Sheikh Omar, inshallah. So we'll, we'll turn it over, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala sallam wa khatam al nabiyin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I want to thank, uh, on behalf of MIFTA Institute as a co-founder, to thank MCC community and the co-sponsors that have been helping organize this event on a short notice. We are very fortunate here this morning to have uh, Dr. Omar Suleiman with us. And uh, this is probably your first introduction to Miftah Institute. Many, many people have been introduced to Yaqeen and the beautiful work that's happening in the Bay Area. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. It is beautiful to see so many young people this early on a weekend, Saturday, to make it to learn about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This class was originally... Um, um, scheduled to be at MCA and it sold out in 10 hours for 1600 tickets and then the wait list on the Miftah platform was over 1500 people and Sheikh Omar was gracious enough to spare his morning which a class that he did last night for three hours and then the the meet and greet that takes time and him visiting Google headquarters um, yesterday so he's been he's been extremely busy but with that um, busy schedule He's been able to sacrifice some time for the community and uh, benefit the, the, the audience. And as all you know, the topic for this morning is perfect timing. And uh, wherever Sheikh Omar Suleiman goes, perfect timing. MashaAllah. And uh, part of my job is to mess up the timing. <laughs> you know, early morning. And uh, we are very fortunate. And the, the message of the Prophet is very simple. I don't have to reiterate the whole entire message. But brothers and sisters, we're here this morning to revive ourselves, our intentions, our motives. Everything the Prophet ﷺ has taught us that we're going to hear from the beautiful, eloquent speech of Sheikh Omar is supposed to be embodied into our body, in our lives. It's not just for um, sketching into our notes and um, beautiful tunes to the ears, but it's something that's supposed to inspire us, our children. Uh, it's been way too long. 
where the calling has been, the calls have been calling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been asking us to turn to Him. And this is one of the best opportunities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates all your presence. The malaika have surrounded the gathering. Nine o'clock in the morning in the Bay Area, people showing up to learn about the Prophet is monumental. I don't want to take too long. Sheikh Omar is on perfect timing. I'd like to invite Dr. Sheikh Omar Suleiman, the president of Yaqeen Institute, the founder of Yaqeen Institute, please. Dr. Omar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How many of you knew Sheikh Abdullah Wahid? No Sheikh Abdullah Wahid. Isn't that the most like tame you've ever seen in mashallah, calm and collected? I'm always afraid of the jokes he's going to make, but alhamdulillah, early, early morning, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala wa sahbihi wa man wala. It's, mashallah, it's a pleasure to be here and to be with you all. Alhamdulillah, uh, I know there are many luminaries here, mashallah, and incredible people and incredible institutions. And one of the things that I would hope to convey, inshallah ta'ala, in the short time that I'm here, very short time, I literally have a flight at two, by the way, at San Jose, so I'm going to like run back to the airport right after this, inshallah ta'ala. You're ta <laughs> I don't know how you drive, though. <laughs> but um, inshallah khair. Uh, but with that being said, um, you know, just to emphasize, to take advantage of your local scholars, to take advantage of your local institutions. Uh, this was the message last night at MCA, because there's so much going on, alhamdulillah. You have a wealth of scholarship and institutions here in this area. And all we're doing is teaching the exact same things. We're reflecting on the Qur'an together. We're reflecting on the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu together. And it's important for everyone to take initiative to be involved wherever they are, inshallah, and to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, with that being said, uh, this is actually a class. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you can take notes, it'll be beneficial, inshallah. Ta Why? Because it's tadabbur on the Qur'an. And one of the beautiful things about reflecting on the Qur'an is that it's endless. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah said that if you read the Qur'an from front to back every single time, it will give you something new. Not a new tafsir, but something new to think about. And knowing the context of the ayat of the Qur'an, knowing the way in which it was delivered to the Prophet ﷺ, will allow you to have a greater appreciation for it. So when you mark down ayat, when you mark down something, maybe that you learn, inshallah ta'ala, you can go back and revisit and do your own tadabbur, do your own reflecting on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to this course. The Qur'an was revealed to us through the Prophet ﷺ, but the means by which it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, the timing of that revelation allows us to have such a great appreciation for the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised the Messenger ﷺ through this to take on the greatest task, and how we too can inshallah ta'ala take on that task of continuing the message of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's a heavy responsibility. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says to the Prophet Sallallahu first and foremost, ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى. We did not reveal this book to you to deprive you. This book was not given to you, revealed upon your heart, to cause you distress. لتشقى is the opposite of sa'adah, of happiness, fulfillment. This was not meant to just discourage you or to cause you distress or to burden you. But at the same time, inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. This is going to be a heavy word, a heavy responsibility. No heart has ever had to bear what the heart of the Messenger وسلم, has to bear. No creation was made capable to carry the Qur'an except for the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that message, in that parallel, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions, مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى in, and إِنَّا سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا There's a message that you realize that when you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for what's best, you may be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what's hardest. And those two things are not in contradiction. When you're asking Allah for what's best, you may be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what's hardest. But at the same time, the meaning, the reward that comes with that burden is 
significant to a point that the burden withers away when you recognize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising you like in return. So what was it like, just to give you this brief element, what was it like to be with the Prophet ﷺ when the Qur'an was descending upon him? In the entire existence of mankind, the Qur'an only came down to this earth within two decades of the span of humanity. To benefit humanity and to be preserved for what remains of it. But it was only for these two decades that this gift of a direct communication from the Lord of the worlds to the heart of the Prophet ﷺ, then to the rest of us, was taking place. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ, Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila, we're going to reveal to you what would flatten mountains onto your heart. One of the wisdoms that the scholars mention of Jibreel alayhi salam squeezing the Prophet ﷺ, the first time he saw him in Hira was to tell him, this is going to be hard. This is going to be a heavy burden. And so he's squeezing him to enact and to impress upon the Prophet ﷺ the weight of this mission. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks revelation to come down to the Prophet ﷺ, he first sends it to Jibreel alayhi salam. He communicates it to Jibreel alayhi salam and Jibreel alayhi salam comes down heaven to heaven to heaven to heaven to heaven to heaven until it reaches the Prophet sallallahu So think about that descent with the Quran. And in every single heaven, the impact of Jibreel alayhi salam descending sets off sets off the bells in every single one of them. And the angels come crowding Jibreel alayhi salam for this momentous occasion. And they are excited to hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They recognize the beauty of this revelation of the Quran. And as they surround Jibreel alayhi salam in every single one of those heavens, they say with anticipation, ماذا قال ربكم؟ ماذا قال ربكم؟ ماذا قال ربكم؟ What did your Lord say? What did your Lord say? What did your Lord say? But he is shadid al quwa entrusted, full of strength. Jibreel alayhi salam will not speak to them of that revelation until he carries it to the intended recipient, the heart of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Jibreel alayhi salam, Sayyid al malaika the greatest of the angels is descending and the angels are surrounding him wanting to know what was said, what's the next surah, what's the next ayah. And Jibreel alayhi salam responds every time with this sentence, Al-Haq, Al-Haq, wa huwa al-Aliyu al-Kabir. He has spoken the truth, the truth, wa huwa al-Aliyu al-Kabir. And he is the most high and the most great. And he comes descending down and the angels join this caravan of Jibreel alayhi salam wanting to hear the Prophet ﷺ's first recitation of this revelation. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ looks up in the revelation of Surah Al-An'am, just as one example. And he said وسلم, to describe the impact. If you could imagine it, just think about screeching or think about something heavy, and difficult. He described the descent of the revelation as Salsalat uh, al-Jaras, like, like a heavy bell, he said, if there were chains dragging over Safa, imagine chains dragging over a mountain. That is the weight of this revelation coming down. And in the revelation of Surah Al-An'am, the Prophet ﷺ was on a camel. And he looked up and he saw Jibreel ﷺ coming down with the revelation with 70,000 angels filling up the entire horizon surrounding Jibreel alayhi salam, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Jibreel is about to bring this to his heart. Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha says, I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam when that happened, and the knees of the camel that he was on buckled from the heaviness of that revelation on the heart of the single man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even the angels are shaken by that revelation. And when it comes on the Prophet 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is given the ability to grasp it. Now Allah says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ If the revelation had come down on a mountain, it would have flattened the greatest mountain in a matter of moments. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the heart of the Prophet ﷺ the capacity to receive it. And it would grip his entire existence, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You would see him sweat, alayhi salatu wa salam. You would see him overtaken by it, shivering at times, but not in a way that resembled any type of illness. So no one could accuse him of anything. It was a very distinct type of gripping his presence, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was clear even on a cold day that something was coming to him, alayhi salatu wa salam. And that reflected itself even in the heaviness of his body because not only did the knees of the camel buckle, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu says, one time I was sitting next to the Prophet sallallahu and his leg was on my leg and revelation came to him and he said, I had thought at that moment that I was going to lose my leg from the weight of the Prophet sallallahu on my leg. I thought my leg was gone as a result of that wahi that was coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do not move your tongue quickly to try to capture it. I want to show you the beauty of this tradition. Uh, if you go to Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the first chapters in Sahih al-Bukhari is Bab la tuharrik bihi lisana karita bih. The chapter of do not hasten with your tongue so that you can capture it. Sa'id ibn Jubair radiallahu anhu narrates from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said that the Prophet sallallahu would do this Sa'id ibn Jubair said I'm moving my lips the way Ibn Abbas moved his lips because Ibn Abbas said that's how the Prophet sallallahu was moving his lips and every narrator of the hadith said that the Prophet sallallahu was doing that what does that mean? like a person who's listening to something and trying to make sure he doesn't forget it if you ever see someone walking around the masjid memorizing Quran that's the, that's the image, right? The Prophet Sallallahu would sometimes receive 15, 20 pages at a time. And at the end of it, he was coherent, fluent, perfect, no stuttering Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no repetition, no mistakes, no grammatical errors. It was the greatest miracle to witness from him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It would flow perfect, perfectly at the moment. Now why would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hasten? There are two reasons. One narration, which shows up in Al-Bukhari and others, is that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make sure he didn't miss anything. I mean, this is a lot of wahi coming down, and this is a momentous occasion. I don't want to miss anything. The second one, Ibn Abi Hatim and Al-Tabari, is that the Prophet ﷺ was anticipating it. He loved it. He loved it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it was his anxiousness to make the relationship sure. that is developed with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a process. And in the beginning, sometimes it may seem foreign, but if you seek refuge in the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they become the source of strength for you that no other thing can replace, that no other thing can take the place of, a source of strength. And so let's start with, the, with this concept here of the order of revelation. I've got it, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair. So one of the beauties of the Qur'an in this regard is that the Qur'an is miraculous in multiple ways in both the placement of the chapters of the Qur'an as well as the order of revelation. And they're two separate things. Meaning, the Qur'an was not revealed Al-Fatiha and then Al-Baqarah and then Ali Imran and then Al-Nisa and so on and so forth, right? So it's miraculous and that when you read the Qur'an, in terms of the order of the placement of surahs, there is something beautiful to be extracted from the relationship of each surah to the previous surah and the one that's after it. And there is a wisdom and a miracle in the way that it all comes back together. So it's full circle in terms of the placement of the surahs, and it's also full circle in terms of the order of revelation when you start to study at what point verses and chapters were revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you start to see this in even the words in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uses to describe the mission so for example 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ One of the first revelations to the Prophet ﷺ was to refer to the Qur'an as a blessing, as a ni'mah. You are not by the blessing of your Lord a madman. You're not by the ni'mah of your Lord a madman. Why? Because they told the Prophet ﷺ, it seems like you've been cursed, possessed, something is coming upon you, and it's not a blessing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have not been made a madman by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one of the first revelations. And the last of those revelations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Surah Al-Ma'idah. Today I have perfected your religion for you and completed my favor upon you, my ni'mah upon you, and chosen for you Islam as your religion. So if the first revelations was, you're not being made a madman by the ni'mah of Allah, and of the last revelations was, I've now completed my ni'mah upon you. And to know that, how it comes full circle, helps you gain a better appreciation of it. Also, one of the first revelations, Surah Al-Rum, a prophecy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ The day that the believers will be pleased with the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are layers of victory, but the ultimate victory, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the help of Allah comes and the opening. So that nasr is alluded to in the very beginning, and you will be pleased when it comes. And there are multiple forms of the aid of Allah, the battle of Badr, and so on and so forth. But the ultimate nasr, material success, the success of your mission, manifest, is when you start to see people embracing this religion from all over the world. All over the world coming to you in delegations to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So both in terms of the, you know, alluding to the nature of this revelation, as well as the success of the mission, it comes full circle. The first words that are used are the last words that are used when you, when you actually embark on the study. Now in terms of the order of placement, I want you to look at something as well, subhanAllah, when you're reading uh, the Qur'an in this way. The first mention of Jannah in the Qur'an is Adam alayhi salam's expulsion from Jannah. The first mention of Jannah, when you read the Qur'an now, not chronologically, when you open the Mus'haf and you start to read, it tells you a story as well. Adam alayhi salam leaves paradise, Adam and Eve, and they are given a road map or a way back to paradise. Okay, so mankind is given a pathway to salvation and warned of the eternal doom that awaits on the other end. So the first mention of Jannah in the Qur'an is Adam alayhi salam. The last mention of paradise is inna a'tainak al-kawthar. We have given you al-kawthar, the highest place of paradise. And the last mention of hellfire is the lowest punishment of hellfire of Abu Lahab. So you talk about full circle. You read in the beginning that look, your parents had to leave paradise but were invited back along with the descendants. And Allah gives you the range of potential here. Here's the highest place and here's the lowest place. Where do you want to situate yourself? The kawthar of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, or the lowest of hellfire with Abu Lahab. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala allow us to be in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la with our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's a story that's told both in the chronological order as well as the placement of the surahs and all of that is miraculous. Are you already tired? Need some coffee. It's an, I know it's early morning uh, for y'all. All right, so here's what we're gonna do inshallah ta'ala in today's class. We're gonna go through five themes of the revelation to the Prophet sallallahu Five themes of the revelation as it pertains to strengthening the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and giving him the fortitude necessary to move forward. And it starts with vision. The visions of the Prophet ﷺ and the initial revelation speaking to that. So vision. Giving him clarity of sight 
What is it that's about to happen to you? And where is this going to take you? And that is a process that takes the entire first 40 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. To prepare him for the momentous occasion of Hira, Allah gives the Prophet ﷺ benchmarks. Okay? The first time he sees Jibreel ﷺ is as a child, when Jibreel ﷺ comes to him and removes his heart and washes the heart of the Messenger ﷺ, and places it back. And the Prophet ﷺ had a surgical mark, makhit, a surgical mark on his chest. From that moment, he could not make sense of what had happened to him as a child. Nor could the people, the children that witnessed that moment where Jibreel ﷺ came to the Prophet ﷺ and did so. No explanation, right? That's one benchmark, right? One way in which Allah ﷻ is starting to prepare the heart and prepare the clarity and the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. Jibreel is not going to come back to the Prophet ﷺ in a manifest way for three decades. Three decades. Everything that happens to the Prophet ﷺ between that moment and the moment where Jibreel comes to him with the revelation in Hira is preparation for the revelation of the Qur'an. All of it was preparation for revelation. So his heart is made clear. His life experience, his character is refined. The Prophet ﷺ sees the good, the bad, and the ugly of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ experiences different circumstances in life, poverty and prosperity, being unknown to being prestigious. He experiences it all wasallam. And now, he starts to see Jibreel ﷺ in dreams, but no explanation. And SubhanAllah, for six months, the Prophet ﷺ sees dreams, where he wakes up in the morning and everything he saw last night happens exactly as he saw it in his dream for six months. Prophecy, the nature of prophecy. That what is shown to you here will eventually manifest itself here. So just stay the course. So for six months, imagine that life. Suddenly you wake up and everything you saw in your dream happens exactly as you saw last night. Six months. And then Aisha radiallahu anha says, Allah bestowed on the Messenger وسلم, the love of seclusion. And this is a very important point here. She didn't say the Prophet وسلم, was forced to Hira or he felt drawn or anxious in Hira. He loved it. He was enjoying it up there. He was going up there for days and then weeks and then sitting in seclusion. He loved those moments of meditation, those moments of contemplation. And the beauty of that pursuit at that point in his life is that it's so pure. People are most heedless when they have it all. That's when you have the potential, the greatest potential to ghafla, to heedlessness, is when you, all, when you have it all. The Prophet ﷺ is living the Qurayshi dream at this point. And you talk about the American dream. The Prophet ﷺ comes from a noble tribe. He has a noble wife. He's got a really nice house now, sallallahu alayhi wa He's known by his character. He is the person that when he walks into a room, everyone is happy. He has it all. He's not missing anything from a dunyawi perspective, from a worldly perspective at this point in his life. So he's not running away from anything. He's not having marital problems at home that's forcing him into a cave. Right? Khadija radiallahu anha and him are, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are at this point of unbreakable love, adoration of one another, to where Khadija radiallahu anha affirms him every step of the way. And the Prophet ﷺ is going up there, and he's going there, as the Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah says, with two motivations. And this is important, because we're going to talk about motivations. Number one, how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, how to save humanity. Those are the motivations. How can I best be a pleasing servant to you, Ya Allah? Everyone else loves me. How do I make you love me? فَكَانَ يَتَحَنَّفْ أَوْ يَتَحَنَّفْ he would worship in an Abrahamic way, yatahannaf, in the way of al-Hanif, in the way of the monotheist. He'd worship Allah in a monotheistic way. He wants to know, how do I become the most beloved servant to you, O Allah? And how do I save my people? How do I save humanity and connect them to you? And he's waiting, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for something to happen. Now he's going up there to develop perspective, not to become a prophet, in his mind, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? 
He's going up there to meditate, to contemplate, to think how to develop perspective. He's not anticipating becoming a Nabi of Allah. The entire time, his heart is being made fertile to receive the Qur'an. So for 40 years, that expansion was taking place. His heart was getting bigger and more beautiful over 40 years. From the time Jibreel Islam washed it, it's only grown and become more capable of receiving what is to come to it. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then Jibreel Islam comes. When he sees Jibreel Islam, he recognizes him. He doesn't recognize what he's about to say to him, but he recognizes him. He said, Alladhi atani fil manam. He's telling Khadija radiallahu anha, the man that I saw in my dreams, came to me in the cave. Now it's already an interesting encounter that's going to happen here. And what the Prophet ﷺ could have thought of is, maybe I'm dreaming again. Maybe this is me thinking I'm awake, but I'm really sleeping. And so Jibreel ﷺ, when he comes to him and he grabs him, he's telling him, this is real, and this is going to be heavy. I'm here, and what's about to come to you is significant. So be ready. And think about the Prophet ﷺ between the arms of Shadid al quwa and the arms of this mighty angel endowed with strength. And the Prophet said, when he hugged me, I felt like I was like my breath was going to leave my body. And that's when the Prophet, by the way, later on, when he's receiving revelation, this is the sentiment, like it grips every part of my body. You got to work out your, you know, your, your ability to be able to receive it. And the first words he says to me are, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ اقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَقْرَمْ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Read in the name of your Lord who creates. Who created man from a suspended clot. Read and your Lord is most generous. The one who taught by the pen taught man that which he knows not. First words that he received sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of this Qur'an. And what does this convey to you? The importance of talab al-ilm, you need to seek this knowledge, pursue this knowledge, and that your Lord gives you this knowledge from a place of generosity. This is what's being conveyed here. Long for this knowledge, seek it, and know that your Lord gives it to you from a place of generosity. We don't have a right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reveal Qur'an to us. We don't have a right upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the... No, this is a gift from your Lord. This is noble. This is his generosity. So it's clarifying to the Prophet ﷺ what his intention should be as, as well as what the intention of the lawgiver is in a few verses. This is what you need to know before we get started. Actions are but by intention. So it clarifies what his niyyah should be and what the intent of the lawgiver is, what the intent of Al-Khaliq himself is. And that's the wisdom of those first few verses to the Prophet ﷺ in those moments. And he comes to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he seeks that comfort from Khadija radiallahu anha. And she comforts him and she affirms him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mentions his noble qualities and affirms him. Alayhi salatu wa salam. Now, at that point, the fatra, which is the pause in revelation, is months and even years according to some. It's a long pause. Can you imagine what the Prophet ﷺ is thinking in those moments, like, what's next? That experience happened. Waraqa, you know, confirms prophethood or that this is the angel that came to Musa ﷺ. What's next? And he, if he was, and we know he was not, if, in the same way that Allah says, walaw taqawwala, if he was concocting this whole story, then he would have done it better, right? Because he would have had a whole script ready, you know? So month one, Iqra, month two, oh, this came down now. No. Prophet is waiting. Ya Allah, what's next? What comes next? And he's going and he's walking in the mountains, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, looking around, looking up. Is there a sign? Is he going to come back? Am I going to see the man again? What's next? And Ibn Hajar rahimahullah says there are two wisdoms for this with the Prophet. Number one, that the Prophet ﷺ would have the burden lightened. It would lighten the burden for him. Look, this was a significant experience that you just had. 
there are many more to come, take it in. So to, to sit with those moments of Iqra for a moment, what happened in Hira? You talk about a life-changing experience, none of us had a moment like that, right? So sit with that for a moment, at takhfifu alayhi. And then he said, the second one, hatta yashtaqu ilayhi, to make the Prophet Sallallahu long for the revelation, to cause him to long for that revelation. So he said there are two wisdoms to this. And the Prophet Sallallahu says in the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, that I'm walking in the mountains, and I'm looking around, and suddenly I look up, and he doesn't see the man that came to him in the cave, he sees him in a different form. He said, I look up at the skies, and I see Jibreel alayhi salam. It's only the first of two times that he'll see him in his full form. Once, in the, in, in, once on earth and once in the heavens. Once on the night of the Salah al-Mi'raj, and once in this particular incident, he'll see Jibreel alayhi salam in his full beauty, his full form. ذو مرة فاستوى A perfect creation of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I saw Jibreel alayhi salam covering up the entirety of the heavens and the earth, sitting on a throne with 600 wings. From those wings, pearls and rubies descend. And he fills up the entire horizon. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذو مرة فاستوى That he is perfect, free from any imperfection. This is such a powerful usage of the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then he started to approach the Prophet As if it wasn't enough for the Prophet now to grasp, he was looking for the man that came from Hira, now he's seeing him covering the entire horizon. He comes so close to the Prophet he's just an arm's length away from him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet ﷺ says, فَجَثِئْتُ You know, Surah Al-Jathiyah describes the moment where the nations are on their knees on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said, جَثِئْتُ I fell to my knees. Like, I mean, this is, subhanAllah, overwhelming. And then he went to Khadija radiallahu anha again. And this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ O oh, you who is wrapped up, Stand up and warn the people. Stand up and warn the people. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِرْ وَالرُّجَزَ فَهْجُرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Wasallam, Stand up and, and warn the people. Revere your Lord alone. Purify your garments. And continue to shun the idols. The Prophet Wasallam already was not an idol worshipper. So continue your path of shunning the idols. And declare the greatness of your Lord now and purify yourself, presumably, to prepare yourself for prayer. And Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says, the entire religion is encompassed in these first two commands. The entire religion is encompassed in these first two commands. Iqra qum. Read, get up. Read, get up. Read, get up. He said the entire deen is ilm and then amal in accordance with that ilm. Knowledge and then action in accordance with that knowledge. Read, get up. Read, get up. Read, get up. Iqra, qum. The whole deen fits within these two. And the Prophet ﷺ then receives the second revelation afterwards of Surah Al-Muzzammil. Ya ayuha al-Muzzammil, qum al-layla illa qalila, nisfahu aw inqus minhu qalila, aw zid alayhi wa rattili al-Qur'ana tartila, inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. O oh, you who is wrapped up in your clothes, stand up all night in prayer except for a little bit of it. Pray half of the night or a little bit less or a little bit more, but recite the Qur'an in a proper and measured way. We're going to reveal upon you a heavy, difficult revelation. This is going to be a heavy word that's about to descend upon you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, by the way, if you pay attention, I've highlighted here. How did the ulama also look at the, the beauty of the connection of al-mudathir to al-muzammir? Allah gives the Prophet ﷺ the command of fatahir, which is to purify yourself. To purify yourself. Okay? Sorry, I know the screens are really small, so I'm like pointing to it. But inshallah ta'ala, maybe we'll send the slides afterwards, inshallah ta'ala, to, to everybody, inshallah, that attended. So fatahir, purify yourself. As in, the order of wudu. And then comes the order of prayer. So preparing him for prayer. So the order comes for the Prophet ﷺ and for Khadija to start to make wudu, 
to purify themselves and get yourself ready for the next thing. The next thing is the night prayer, Qiyam al And Qiyam was the first prayer that was made obligatory in Islam. Not the five prayers. The first prayer that was made mandatory was Qiyam al Tahajjud. For a year or two, this was the prayer that they would pray at night. And then Allah revealed the last verse of Surah Al-Muzzammil, which made it optional. So first, Surah Al-Muzzammil, the first page came down. And then, the second page, which is one long verse, came down, in adna, which made it optional for the Prophet ﷺ to pray. So I want you to think about this for a moment. You know all those verses, all those ahadith that talk about Allah's interaction with us in the night prayer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descending and asking who is seeking in His Majesty Subhanahu Wa Taala, who's seeking my forgiveness, who's calling upon me, and Allah Azza Wa Jal extending the opportunity for His pleasure, for His forgiveness. At some point, there were only three people in the world, one household, that was calling upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in this way. One household in, in the entire world that was standing up and praying Qiyam and reading the Quran, and that was the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Khadija radiallahu anha, and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, which is a narration from Afif al-Kindi. He said that, you know, at some point, subhanAllah, it's just these three, they were praying together. Think about that. How incredible that is. Calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sustenance to be able to go forward. The sincerity to sustain the actions that they have now been called to. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the wisdom for which he gives the Prophet ﷺ some first qiyam. He says to him, Inna laka fin, he says, uh, Inna nashiyata laydi hiya ashaddu wat'an wa aqwa muqila. Look, the night time is a time where you can develop a more impactful relationship with the Qur'an and it's more suitable to the recitation. Ashaddu wat'an means that what you're going to get out of that night prayer is unlike what you would get if you pray during the day. And there's a lot of truth to that, subhanAllah, even until now. The more difficult things become, the more qiyam with the Qur'an becomes a cure for you. And qiyam is a cure. And you know during the day, you have a lot going on during the day. All of us have things going on. But there's a peacefulness and a stillness in the night that if a person stands with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to give them a greater result. It's going to generate something inside of them that nothing else can generate inside of them. And it's more suitable to the recitation. The Prophet said the one who memorizes the Quran but doesn't stand up and pray with it is like a person who doesn't tie their camels. Camels go loose. They run away. They flee from you. And so even the most impactful time in terms of reciting the Quran and benefiting from the revelation, memorizing it, it's that time at night Right? The beginning of the night, the end of the night, the point is, is that it's not during the hustle and bustle of the daytime. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there is also something profound about addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in this way, by the way, which is al-mudathir al-muzzamil. Why is Allah referring to him by the one who's seeking to be covered, the one who's seeking to be embraced? A profound message here. Who's giving the Prophet a sense of safety and who's giving him a sense of comfort? Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, right? Khadija is the one that's giving the Prophet a sense of safety and a sense of comfort now. And here, as the scholars say, Allah is telling the Prophet you're no longer going to receive safety and comfort from Khadija, you're now going to receive it from me. Al-Hanan wal-Aman, laysa min Khadija al-An, al-Hanan wal-Aman, faqat min al-Rahman. As the scholars say, your comfort and safety is no longer from Khadija radiallahu anha at this point. Now, your comfort and your safety is from Ar-Rahman. You're going to seek it from Ar-Rahman. So you're not going to run from the revelation into the arms of Khadija radiallahu anha. You're going to flee to the revelation and start to seek that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَيَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرِ Mudathir refers to someone who's seeking cover for safety. To peer, to cover them from the bugs, to cover them from the weather, to cover them from a sense of safety. Qum fa'andir, stand up and call the people. Safety will actually come to you from al-mu'min, from the one who gives safety, when you stand up 
and put yourself in the most vulnerable place to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It might not seem that way initially, but that's where true safety is going to come. بلغ ما أنزل إليك من ربك إن لم تفع فما بلغت رسالة والله يعصمك من الناس. Allah is going to protect you because of your da'wah. You know, a lot of us we think that if I get too religious, and especially by the way, people that grew up under repressive regimes, maybe that were repressive, especially with Islamic activities, and Subhanallah, we're seeing a comeback of that in so many different parts of the world, right? And they worry about their kids. Don't go to the masjid too much. Don't start to look too religious. Don't. That was a thing for multiple people. It can become a thing, and it comes from a good place. And sometimes we might think it's not safe. It's not safe to look Muslim. It's not safe to talk Muslim. It's not safe to be Muslim. And Allah is saying, actually, I will grant you safety as a result of that. I'll grant you safety and I'll grant you protection because of your da'wah. All right? So al-mudathir, who seeks cover, seeks safety from al-mu'min now. And al-muzammil, zammiluni, you're seeking comfort from Khadija radiallahu anha, now your comfort is going to be in qiyamul layl. Your comfort's going to be standing up at night and praying, and that's where you're going to find the contentment and the steadfastness to be able to sustain you in the message that you have ahead of you. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala redirects the Prophet in vision in the first pursuit. Now, he also, as he describes the Prophet state and tells him how he's going to change his state, and I'm going to give you guys a break after this, by the way, inshallah. I think you all need to get up and stretch. I, I feel bad looking at you sitting on the floor and stretching your legs. I, I get it. I get it. If I was in your place, I'd be doing the exact same thing. I'd be sitting there, like, you know, kicking the guy in front of me by accident. I'm like, I understand. So may Allah reward you all and make it all heavy on your scales for sitting and allow you to be surrounded by the angels. Allahumma ameen. One of the things that Allah also does is He gives three prototypes of the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ from the very beginning revelations. It's very interesting because the three enemies of the Prophet ﷺ that He describes, every enemy that the Prophet ﷺ will encounter over the next two decades fits one of the molds. He fits one of these prototypes. So the first one is Abu Jahl. This is speaking about Abu Jahl primarily. Do you see that arrogant person that is trying to stop the people from praying? Who's the one going to the Kaaba and trying to stop the Prophet and not letting people pray? It's Abu Jahl is the primary person here. So this is the first prototype. Abu Jahl was the tribalist. And tribalism doesn't go away throughout human history. It just evolves into other forms of tribalism. There's political tribalism too, right? But tribalism takes the form of multiple ideas of superiority and supremacy to where Abu Jahl says, we cannot let Banu Hashim have a prophet. This had nothing to do with Muhammad Sallallahu It had nothing to do with the Quran. It is, I am from, does anyone know Abu Jahl's tribe? Exactly, <laughs> right? Like you ask people, what's Abu Jahl's tribe? Most Muslims can't name it, Banu Makhzum. His whole thing was how can we let Banu Hashim, if I ask you who the Prophet tribe was, most of you will be able to say Banu Hashim. How can I let Banu Hashim get a prophet? Can't do it. We are the people who always have to maintain a supremacy in society. We can't let them get the upper hand this way. So Abu Jahl is the tribalist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dismisses him in this way. Reminds him that you are just an extension of that alaq and you're a very poor version of what that alaq evolved into. The lowest of law. Right? Puts him back in his place. Dismisses him, the tribalist. The second prototype is Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab is the wealthy man. A man of great wealth. And I said this last night, and I'll say it again, because it's very important. I think that sometimes we uh, characterize some of the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ in a way that maybe gives a skewed version. Was Abu Lahab this really, you know, uh, foul, nasty human being that was, you know, dressed nasty, he kind of fits like, you think of Abu Lahab, you think of a guy like walking in, you know, belching, holding his beer bottle, like all messy and stuff like that, and just really foul and vulgar. Actually, Abu Lahab was very handsome, very well put together, very wealthy, right? A really rich, well put together man. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu two daughters were engaged to his two sons. He shares a wall with the Prophet Sallallahu This is his uncle. 
And Abu Lahab, to him, this was a math game. Even the way he objected to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ stands on Safa and says, I'm calling you to la ilaha illallah. He said, I've got 360 gods and I'm making money off of these gods. We're exploiting the people through these gods. We've got a whole business going with these gods. And literally, the words he uses, he said, you brought us here so that you could turn all these gods into one god? We're not dumb. We're not going to let you do that to us. This is our society. This is how we make our money. He's a businessman. It's a math game to him. And he curses the Prophet ﷺ. So one person is veiled by their tribalism. This person is veiled by his wealth. Like this is a money thing for me. It's a material thing for me. I can't give up my material attachments for this message that you're calling to. And the third person is a man by the name of Al-Walid ibn, ibn al-Mughira. He's the father of Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira could not possibly consider how someone who has less than him could be given something greater than him. The expectations. You know like in Surah Al-Kahf, the man who has two gardens, right? Versus the one who has one garden. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, an kana dha malin wa banin. I got more money than him. I've got children. I've got prestige. Why didn't the Quran come to one of us? Why did it come to him? Who is he anyway? So Al Walid was deluded by his privilege. Deluded by his privilege. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made an example out of him as well. So every single person in the seerah, every enemy of the Prophet is going to fit one of these three prototypes, with no exception, by the way. Zero exception. Even the hypocrites in Medina, they fit one of the prototypes with the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone from Kisra to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sarur speaks in the language of Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, or Al-Walid ibn Mughira. So I'm giving you the three types of people you're going to encounter in this mission. Now out of these three, who's the one person who's named in the Qur'an? Y'all are really tired now. <laughs> who's the one person named in the Qur'an? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. Why? You know, if you take it from a harm perspective, like the most active opponent of the Prophet ﷺ was who? Who was the most active opponent? Abu Jahl. First one to shed blood. The, the one who, I mean, Abu Jahl was obsessed. Going to the Kaaba every day, stomping Abu Bakr, punching the Prophet ﷺ, killed Sumayya radiallahu anha. Like he doesn't stop. He's obsessed. He's the Fir'aun of this Ummah. But he's not named in the Qur'an. Why Abu Lahab? And this is subhanAllah deeply profound. You know, when, you, when you're in a gathering, the most prominent person in the gathering, or someone whose opinion weighs more, people will look to that person and they'll gauge their reactions after that person. With the bay'ah to the Prophet ﷺ from Medina, they looked at As'ad ibn Zurara. As'ad ibn Zurara gave the go with confidence. All the Ansar gave the go. When Badr happened, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said, we're with you. They all said, we're with you. When the Prophet ﷺ stands on Safa, to call the people to Islam. People who he has gained the respect of and love of for 40 years that know nothing but good of him, there's a viable option there to where if the most important people in that gathering respond properly, everyone's going to respond that way. Right? Because mala and jumhur, this is the human psychology. You got the leaders, you got the followers. Most people are going to look to the leaders in the gathering and they will follow in accordance with that. And the Prophet ﷺ has a defining moment. What if? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined a trajectory in his wisdom. But just think human psychology. If Abu Lahab said, we've got your back, oh my nephew. A lot of people in that gathering would say, oh, if Abu Lahab, yeah, we buy this too. We're in. We're in, we're in with you, Ya Rasul. We know your character. We know you're a sadiq al-ameen. But when Abu Lahab humiliates his nephew, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that way, with that voice, and curses him with the dirtiest of curses and turns away from him, everybody else says, oh, Abu Lahab did that. They all did the same thing. Everybody else followed Abu Lahab away from that gathering and he was left alone, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, completely humiliated and estranged, standing on Safat, like what just happened? SubhanAllah, these people who used to embrace me and love me, and in one moment Abu Lahab says to me these curse words and turns away and they all just follow him like that? SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Abu Lahab, 
who humiliated the Prophet ﷺ and left him alone in his humiliation and humiliated Abu Lahab instead permanently and left him alone as the single named person who will be humiliated for eternity. Just as you left the Prophet ﷺ on a safa, you will be left for all of mankind. And Muslims love to read the last surahs of the Qur'an, right? The shortest ones. You will be left for all of eternity right there for everyone to read about your humiliation and to read about your punishment. By the way, if Abu Lahab wanted to undermine the mission of the Prophet ﷺ, what could he have done? He could have easily said, I'm Muslim now. Now we have a conundrum. Your hellfire is already specified in the Qur'an. What do we do? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what he's doing. This is the wisdom and the perfection and the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you tried to leave the Prophet ﷺ alone in his humiliation, you will be left alone in the Mus'haf named and humiliation. And the one respite, the one refuge that he has in his entire eternal existence is the one moment he honored the Prophet ﷺ. What am I speaking about? It's actually an authentic hadith, Al-Abbas who was the brother of Abu Lahab. He saw Abu Lahab in a dream after he died. And he saw him looking miserable. Miserable. So he said that I said to him, Mada laqit? Like, what happened to you? All that for nothing. Where, where's all that wealth now? All the, those fine clothes and the fine camels and horses and the house and well put together. And he just looked beat up and miserable. Mada laqit? What did you find? And you know what Abu Lahab says? He says, that I have not found rest since the day I left you, except Allah gave me water of this amount. For what? When the Prophet ﷺ was born, he freed a slave by the name of Thuwayba radiallahu anha, in honor and in joy and celebration that his nephew was born sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the one moment he honored the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the only thing Allah gave me was this much water to drink for that time that I freed the Wayba. So subhanAllah, he's eternally humiliated for seeking to dishonor the Prophet ﷺ, and his one respite from humiliation is the one time he honored the Prophet ﷺ in his life. And so this is the beginning of revelation to the Messenger ﷺ. It is the vision that is given to the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. I think you all need a break now because I see you struggling with your legs. It's going to be like at least a stretch break. Get up and move around and whatever you need to do inshallah ta'ala. And I'll hand it to Shaykh Abdullah inshallah ta'ala and we'll get started uh, shortly after inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, mashallah. Eid Mubarak. It's good to see everybody here. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ali wa ala ali Zuhurra dinun mu'ayyad Bidhuhuril hadi ahamad Zuhurra dinun mu'ayyad Bidhuhuril hadi ahamad يا حنان نبي محمد يا حنان نبي محمد يا حنان نبي محمد ذلك الفضل من الله يا حنان صلاة الله سلام الله على طه رسول الله صلاة الله سلام الله على ياسين حبيب الله Salat Allah, Salam Allah, Ala Taha Rasulillah. Everybody, Salat Allah, Salam Allah, Ala Yasin Habibillah. Salat Allah, Salam Allah. 
viaja malo Si na na viaja malo Ay viaja malo viaja malo Si na na viaja malo Maula ya salli wa sallam Lim da iman abada Ala habibi ka khai Ril khanki kulli himi Ya Rabbi bil Mustafa Balig ma qasidna Waqfir lana ma madha Ya wasi al karami Ya Jamalu, Ya Jamalu, Sina Nabi, Ya Jamalu, Ya Jamalu, Ya Jamalu, Sina Nabi, Ya Jamalu, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala alayhi. Jazakum al khair. Assalamu alaikum. Takbir. Let's give him one more round of applause for Brother Uthman. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala sinam wa khatim al-Nabiyyin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. There's a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, إِنَّ هَذِي الْخَيْرَ الْخَزَائِنِ This religion is a treasure. وَلِكُلِّ الْخَزَائِنِ مَفَاتِيحِ and every single treasure has keys, which is our religion. Lucky are the people who are the keys to good and the locks to evil. And woe to those people who become the keys to evil and the locks to opportunities in khair. Miftah Institute started four or five years ago in Michigan. And... Uh, it was a project or an incentive. The incentive was basically to help young professionals, people who are out of college, and I think people who are 60 years old, they consider themselves young too, even they're bald. But it helps, you know? Uh, so we, we started to expand the operation to people who are professionals and who are busy in their careers. Alhamdulillah, in um, four years, we have 300 students that come on site, nine to 10 hours a week in the evenings after work, and they've mastered the language in Arabic. We have an associate's program, a uh, three years program. I'll tell you what, what's our pilot program that we do in the, Rum, in, in the Sira program. Every single winter break for the past five years, we've been teaching the Sira intensive. I have the honor to teach it myself. And it's seven days long, seven hours a day, and we have over 400 students across America that attend this live. And there are a lot of people that attend it on, online. Uh, once the slides um, are put up, I will, I will explain more about the programs. But brothers and sisters, the whole idea was, uh, my, my parents are immigrants from Pakistan, and they came here in the early 80s, physicians, and we, they had five sons. And they decided in this country they're gonna make them first hafiz and alims and muftis, which we didn't have much options when we were young. And they were firm on their commitment. Alhamdulillah, all five of us brothers became scholars in Michigan and Canada. And we went back to Karachi and studied. And then uh, two years ago, my fifth brother who graduated, uh, five months after graduating, four months after graduating in 2020, um, unfortunately died in a tragic car accident. And uh, we are still mourning the situation. It's difficult. But overall, we see the Prophet's life, his seerah, the difficulties that he went through in the mission of da'wah. We all have to go through difficulties. And it gets challenging as you serve the religion and times will come that you don't want to serve anymore. I remember three days after the tragedy, uh, our mother looked at us and she grabbed our sweaters because this is October 5th and 8th. Um, he, she grabbed our sweaters and our jackets and she put them in front of us. She said, I didn't raise you to mourn more than three days. Go back, you have students waiting for you. We have also have a boarding school that has 150 students uh, from across America that become scholars for seven years, they study there. So Miftah Institute was an initiative that we started, alhamdulillah, it grew. We recently purchased a property 
um, 80,000 square feet with an auditorium of 2,000 seatings. Uh, we last year hosted Khabib Numegamerov three times. We had a we hosted him in Detroit, then we hosted him in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and then we also hosted him in Seattle. So different scholars, different athletes, professionals, whatever we can do to get, get to the minds of the youth. And uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman has kindly, um, you know, offered his services with us to travel across the country, even across the world. And Sheikh Yasser Qadi also travels with Miftah now. We do a Sira program called Practical Lessons from the Sira, and we go around different states. So Miftah's most important message that we have, we want every single person that's here, that's listening, to have a fair opportunity to learn Arabic. Understand the Quran. What Sheikh Omar Suleiman is teaching and talking about, you all can learn this. You can all connect with the Quran. It takes just few months, few years, and it takes passion. And the more passion you have, Allah will make it easy for you. People learn Java language coding very late in their life. They start new careers. We're not asking you to leave your careers. We're just asking you to complement your careers. Learn a little bit about the religion, especially the Quran and tafsir. Once you understand that, you go to college, you'll enjoy life. What's happening recently, we're going to have, inshallah, March 2nd, um, we're, ha we're having a knowledge retreat. We're expecting a thousand people. And just heads up, it is common that any class or course Mifta puts out online, on social media, on Instagram, it's sold out within a few days. It's completely sold out. Not because of the brand of the speaker, but also people want the content. This knowledge uh, retreat, it's a five days Quran immersion program. Sheikh Omar Suleiman will be there. And his collaboration with Yaqeen, Maghrib, Miftah, and IOK from California. Give IOK a round of applause, guys. One of your local institutions. All four or five major institutions in America are collaborating. We did it last year in Dallas. And we're expecting over 1,200 people to be with us for five days. Um, can you just go to the knowledge retreat? Just uh, one slide back up. Up, one more, please. Thank you. This is the knowledge retreat. If you can put a wide screen, if it's possible, please. Thank you. Um, March uh, 2nd to March 6th, you can see um, Yaqeen, Qalam, Mifta, and Maghrib Institute are all collaborating. And I, I hope to see people from the Bay Area. Are you guys excited to come to Michigan? No. <laughs> this will be one of the reasons to come by. Just take a break from life. Take a break from your spouse, you know, from life. Babysitting, everything is organized. You just come, rent some rooms nearby, you'll enjoy it. And the, the, the culture is so welcoming. People feel so welcome, non-judgmental. Just come and study, inshallah. The next slide, please, Brother Munir. I'm the, weather. the weather, the weather may be a little cold, but the people are warm. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. And the next uh, is Miftah Portal. Miftah Portal is an option where you can self-based study. We have over, um, I think we have over 100 classes now on Arabic, tafsir, marriage, fiqh of salah, fiqh of zakah. So you can go into the history section, all the um, um, classes on, for example, Karbala, examples of the history of the Khilafah. You can self-pace, your, you, if you're interested in any um, subjects of Islamic sciences, you wanna, you're weak on, say, fiqh, I wanna learn how to pray, zakah, I wanna learn more about tafsir, whole section of tafsir. And the, the idea is to have the entire Quran, we're on the project of this, tafsir on the Miftah portal. You, uh, Miftah portal subscription is $3.99 a month. And within, I think, two months, it's gonna to jump to $11.99 because the app is coming out. Thousands of people have already subscribed. The cost of this portal goes back to the operations of the program, but just so we can continue to back end control the network. You would be surprised what you're going to see for the small budget of expense. It's all available at the tip of your finger. It's user-friendly and it's also interactive. You can ask questions and the notes of the classes are also posted. So I have done a class on Surah Tafsir, on Tafsir on Surah Waqi'ah, Hujrat. Notes are printed out, typed out. You can use those notes for teaching your children. That's a Niftah portal. It's more for ourselves than for others. And then we have other classes on the portal that are coming up, it's called the Preserve class. I'll go ahead for this one, please. Miftah Online. You guys are from California. You guys can't all make it to Michigan because it's too cold, for, you know? But you can sit at the warmth of the comfort of your home and learn Arabic online. 
If you can't afford it, just email Miftah and tell us you make $300,000 a year, but you want a free class. <laughs> we'll give it to you. But just be honest. Tell them, I don't feel like paying. You get a free class. But obviously, any, any cost, anything you pay for, you value more. Right? I, how much were the tickets for this program? 35? Wow, that was expensive. <laughs> and no lunch? No breakfast? I apologize, guys. I'll, I should refund your money. You know? But if we made them like $10, there'd be <laughs> no space. But the cost covers expenses, the programs, the growth. If we want to grow, you need to have a little bit assets. You need to have financial backing. And there's so much demand out there. So Miftah Online, you can enroll, learn Arabic, and they have different subjects for every semester. I humbly request everyone here, everyone has an opportunity to learn. You know, in, those, in the previous generations, you had to travel. I had to travel away from home for 10 years to learn Quran, and then learn Arabic. Then I had to travel across the Atlantic. You can do this all accessible. Post-COVID, man, everything has become easier. Of course, the interaction, sitting in front of the teacher, having a mentor, it doesn't, there's nothing that substitutes this. But if you can value the opportunities online, Allah will give you more opportunities in person. Taking advantage, and like I said, no one should be using the excuse of affordability. It's just about passion. And then we have Quran Ascension. Quran Ascension is for our children who are trying to learn the Quran and they don't have time after school. Their teachers can't come over to their homes, but they can't find time after school to go or on the weekends. All this is accessible with our graduates who are Qadis, English speaking, young, our Quran Ascension teachers are between, I think, 22 and 29. We want to have them youth that teach perfecting the voice, the tajweed, and they cater to your schedule. You can have one-on-one -on -one based Quran classes for your daughter and your son. Or you can have a group study on Quran Ascension. And the most beautiful thing about this is I have my child involved. I want my child to learn one-on-one -on -one for, for like two months. You know, I want that coaching. So Quran Ascension gives you group options for sisters, mothers. We have people who are married, who are now grandmothers, mashallah. They're like, I have to fix my tajweed. I want to learn some surahs. They join the Quran Ascension and it caters. The most important thing about Quran Ascension, it caters to your timing, your availability. You can slot it, inshallah, it will help. Thank you. Then, of course, the Miftah Talent. Miftah Talent was an uh, idea of just beginning with the students, the children, to have a beautiful voice, creating a, a, a passion for them to recite the Quran with, a, with confidence. So you can go to the Miftah Talent. Last but not the least, Miftah Seekers. There's so much on this, point, on this presentation. Miftah Seekers, what is this? I know this is going to be a hard call. Um, but we at Miftah started this year a one-year um, intensive program. And we're asking young professionals, college youth, to take a year gap from life, from the world, before going to grad school, and just come and learn for nine months. In these nine months, you will learn Arabic, you will walk out, understand the Quran, 100% better, 100%. We had right now at this, we started the first year, we launched it later, we have 25 students. We have students going to law school at Georgetown, Michigan University. We have medical students who have taken out one gap year, dental students. <coughs> we have some parents that came from Kentucky with their daughter and they rented apartments. What this does is honestly, it just changes your perspective on life. What you can get in those nine months you look back and say, this is the best choice I've made in my life. Spiritually, emotionally, academically from the knowledge aspect. So I can't stress this. I know some people are like, how am I going to bring out nine months in my life from work? There's a couple, there's a guy who's an engineer who makes over $250,000 a year. His wife's a PA who makes at least 100K a year. I have a child who's one year old. They both, one applied and the wife is like, I want to learn too. So they both applied. And we said, guys, someone has to pay the bills. And the, son, the, the husband was like, I have a backup plan. I, I know how to flip cars. So let, me, let, me, let us both join. Both of them join. They are sacrificing this year around $400,000, $300,000 to be on this program. It's almost equal to someone donating $300,000 in one year to be part of this program. Either they're crazy or they're looking for paradise. And to be a passionate person for paradise, you have to have a little bit madness in you for the deen. So we hope that all of us here can join some part of the program. 
Brothers and sisters, I know you guys are, are part of the MCC. I humbly request that you guys support your community. Wherever you are, everywhere we go for this type of program, we do a Miftah Pledge Drive. Miftah Pledge Drive is we want people to subscribe, people to donate monthly, but that's not what I'm going to do tonight or this morning. I want you all to show, support your local community. Support online the, uh, the projects that MCC is doing, the youth are doing, the Dawa community is doing, Sister Rania, Dr. Rania Awad is doing. And if you are done supporting them, you said I've supported them enough this year, you're more than welcome supporting Miftah. Your, your reach at Miftah will be global. We are now traveling to Kenya, England, and if you go onto the Miftah website, you will see the entire next few months are locked in. There is no weekend available for our scholars. The whole idea is the public is waiting for some opportunity. So my humble request is not to support Miftah today. It's to support your own institutions, your own communities, your own projects, your own scholars, your own youth directors, and then funnel these projects into supporting bigger causes around the community. But if you're on social media and you want to go to paradise quick, make sure you follow Miftah. You know? Not on TikTok, astaghfirullah. That will reverse your ticket to Jannah. <laughs> you know, I'm just joking. TikTok is, uh, uh, you know, it's becoming Sunnah so far. But overall, we want everyone to be hooked onto religion in any way, shape, or form. But if there's anyone that's in this crowd that wants to support Miftah at any, any, plat, any level, you can go on the Miftah page and monthly support Miftah. Monthly support your institutions. What happens from these institutions? You are going to have Sadqa Jariya that you won't even imagine. Sadqa Jariya. There are people sitting here who are first time coming to the masjid after COVID. There are people that came yesterday to the MCA first time after COVID. They just need another spark. So inshallah, everyone here, they will do something for the community, learn knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kun aliman, become a scholar. Or muta'aliman, or become a student. You have to be one of these two. Next, if you can't become a student because you're busy, mustami'an, at least listen, learn. If you can't become a listener on podcasts, on YouTube, in classes, muhibban, at least love knowledge. I want that, I want that opportunity. If you paid attention, the first thing Allah says in the Quran is Iqra. And then He uses Qalam twice. Allama bil Qalam. Right away. Qalam and Iqra. Back to back. There needs to be that education. And one of the things I realized through environment and education, you don't even know, but you're becoming a better Muslim. There's like this, you get manipulated in, in crying in tahajjud. Like, I wasn't planning to cry for tahajjud. I was just planning to come to a class of Umar Sulaiman. But that's what knowledge does to you. You're sitting shoulder to shoulder with your brothers and sisters here. There are pious people in this gathering. It's not our speeches. It's not, it's the sincerity of people in this hall. There are going to impact you more than the speakers sometimes. There are people who are going through hardships, difficulties. And them being on the same platform with you, what, what is Makkah? I'll give you an example of Makkah is. Makkah is the Kaaba. But it is also the people that come to Makkah that are crying, right? Just that clock tower took away the ronak of the Kaaba, <laughs> like the beauty of the Kaaba, right? the clock tower. The sincere people around are, are always in our communities. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our hearts with love. And inshallah, you guys enjoy the last part of the program. I don't know if Dr. Omar Suleiman is in the hall. Is there anyone? Sheikh yeah, yeah. Omar, you can come in, I want to jump you. I don't really invite him to the stage at the same time I'm on the stage. A few reasons. He's 6'9", and I'm 6'2". <laughs> <laughs> Give a round of applause for Dr. Omar Suleiman. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So we've covered one theme, and that theme was vision the vision that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu of what was to come. The second theme that we will cover is a beautiful one and a significant one, it's affirmation. Remember, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is redirecting the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Khadija Radiallahu Anha to him, Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And the way that Allah affirms the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in early revelations is through various uh, means, one of them 
which is significant, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never even calls the Prophet ﷺ by name. He never calls upon him, Ya Muhammad, in the name of Nida, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or, or directly addressing someone, Allah addresses them as Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, O Messenger of Allah. And every time Allah mentions his name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions it with the sifa, with the attribute of prophethood, Muhammadun Rasulullah. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So it's a constant connection of the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the idea of being a messenger and being a prophet. And even when he corrects him sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he distances the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's name to a point that he addresses him in third person and does not mention his name nor his rank. So that there would be no dishonor to the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abasa wa tawalla an jaahu al-a'ma. He frowned and he turned away. Not Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam frowned and turned away. Not Rasulullah turned and frowned away. Abasa he turned and he frowned. Uh, even when Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions the hypothetical, walau taqawwal alayna baad al-aqawil. Had he invented something of this from his own. He distances the name of the Prophet ﷺ from such an accusation or even the possibility of such. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the purity of his thoughts. مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Your companion has not gone astray, nor is he mad. Allah praises the purity of his heart. So the purity of his thoughts, the purity of his heart. أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ Did we not expand? your chest. Allah praises the purity of his character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Just because people have now started to question you, you are on an exalted standard of character. You always were, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on an exalted standard of character. And this does not change. It is only further amplified now that you have received the message. Allah affirms the purity of his intentions. This is powerful. Why? Because Abu Lahab was in it for something else. Abu Jahl was in it for something else. All these people were in it for something else. And people of dirty intentions are quick to assume the same of others. People, that's why they say a liar always thinks everyone else around them is lying, right? People of nastiness assume nastiness of others that maybe the Prophet ﷺ has a price. So what is it? What do lo tudhinu fayudhinun? What do you want? We wish you'd compromise, we will happily compromise, right? Name the price. There's got to be something else behind this. And Allah says, Azizun alayhi ma'anitum. Harisun alaykum bil mu'minina ra'ufun rahim. How concerned is the Messenger وسلم, for you? How pure is his love for you? He is like a man وسلم, standing in front of a fire trying to catch people from jumping into it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the authenticity of his revelation. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى He doesn't speak from his own. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the soundness of the one who delivers that revelation. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى The one who taught him, the instructor, is none other than an angel of mighty strength. Allah defends him from his enemies. فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ Allah will suffice you in regards to them. And even as time goes on, he faces other harm from his own community at times. And even if it comes through his own household, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you alladina amanu la takunu kaladina adha musa. O you who believe, don't be like those who harmed Moses. Don't be like those who harmed Musa Islam from within. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified him from what they said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Surah Al Hujurat, for example, to put boundaries around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because in his own nature, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he did not do that for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the boundaries around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And even when it came to his own family, surah al-Tahrim, surah al-Talaq, that Allah has privileged the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with a mighty privilege because he's given him a capacity and a burden like no other. And finally, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have elevated your mention. And there is no greater implication. You know, I want you to think about this. At any moment, there is literally no moment in time that someone is not saying, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That someone is not saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That someone is not teaching or learning the seerah or practicing a sunnah. 
He is literally remembered, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at all times, in every part of the earth. But, what's greater than all of that? The greatest implication of, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We've elevated, exalted your mention. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Allah and His angels send prayers upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Who do you think you are? to not send salawat on the Prophet So the greatest implication of Allah exalting his mention is look how Allah and the angels speak of him and honor him So let's look at some of the early revelations uh, in this regard. The most obvious pair that comes, and in fact, according to Ibn Mas'ud they're even like one surah. He would read it in one breath or in one surah, uh, in one rak'ah, uh, Surah Al-Duha, now I'm not going to do a tafsir of these ayat. I want to speak to the way or the timing of the revelation and some of the implications to the mission at the moment. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded to stand up and pray at night. And you talk about encountering hardship. He shared a wall with Abu Lahab. His house was next to the house of Abu Lahab. And he was humiliated constantly by Abu Lahab and Umm Jamil, the wife of Abu Lahab. They would shout out insults. They would throw things at the Prophet ﷺ. They would constantly make his life difficult. And they knew when he's standing up and praying at night because they could hear him. And the Prophet ﷺ became sick for some time, according to the narration of Jundub ibn Abdullah And he wasn't able to stand up and pray. And the revelation did not come to him at a certain speed. So the wife of Abu Lahab says to him, Aina shaytanu yanzilu ilayk? Where is that devil that descends upon you? Where is he at? Not an angel. Where is the devil that descends upon you? Ma arahu illa qad qalak. I don't see except that he has abandoned you. Except that he hates you. Talk about emotional abuse, subhanAllah, towards the Prophet And Allah reveals, Wadduha refers to the morning brightness. The morning brightness. Walaydi ida saja, the dead night. It's actually a very powerful usage of language. The night as it's still. Like the Prophet is waiting for the wahi. The revelation is like light to a still night. When's it going to come? Anticipating it. Walduha, walaydi ida saja. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Your Lord has not abandoned you. Nor has he despised you. And the hereafter, what comes next, is better for you than what is present. And your Lord will give you until you are pleased. We're going to talk about that ayah, inshallah. But here. Didn't Allah find you as an orphan and then take care of you? Who can tell me what the implication of this is? How did Allah take care of him as an orphan? All right, don't make me miss my flight, please. <laughs> How did Allah take care of him as an orphan? Yeah. Protected him from exploitation, put him in the hands of people that loved him. Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, Halima Sa'diya radiallahu anha, when she took the one boy, the one orphan that no one took, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her through the Prophet ﷺ. You were taken care of as an orphan. We provided you protection. We gave you that love. And he found you searching, and he guided you. What is this referring to? Ghar Hira, the Qur'an. Now, actually, the majority of the Mufassirin say something else. And I'll tell you exactly why. Because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَائِنًا فَأَغْنَى Allah found you poor and he put you in a place of self-sufficiency. This was through what incident in his life? Khadija, the marriage of Khadija radiallahu anha, which is prior to revelation. So the sequence of the ayah would not make sense if this is referring to the wahi of the Qur'an. The scholars say, actually, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was guiding the Prophet ﷺ towards the fitrah throughout his childhood and throughout his adult life before revelation even came to him. The priming of the Prophet ﷺ for revelation. How? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him away from idol worship even before Hira. 
He never drank alcohol, sallallahu alayhi wa He never committed adultery. Even when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa I mean, there are two narrations that are profound, subhanAllah. One of them, he says that Al-Abbas, sallallahu anhu, came to him when they were rebuilding the Kaaba. They were reconstructing the Kaaba, and they used to not care for exposing themselves. So they'd use their lower garment to place hot rocks on their uh, shoulders and necks. And the Prophet ﷺ had a natural hayat, a natural modesty to him. He didn't do that. So the Abbas told him, put, the, put your garment up and carry a stone. And when the Prophet ﷺ was about to do that, Allah caused him to collapse. And he's, he's laying on the ground. He said, I looked up to the, to the skies and I said, Izari, Izari, where's my bottom? Where's my bottom? And it was tied on the Prophet ﷺ. Another time where they went out to their festivals, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so that the Prophet ﷺ slept through the whole thing. So Allah was protecting him the entire time and guiding him to his natural fitrah throughout his entire childhood and his entire adult life away from anything that would undermine the mission in advance of it. Then he married him to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and elevated him uh, from a place of poverty to a place of self-sufficiency. So why is this significant in this particular class? Because Allah is mentioning favors prior to revelation. Because what's the greatest favor? Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Did we not expand your heart to give it the capacity to receive the greatest miracle and blessing of all time? See now how it connects? So remember all these favors before? Now here's the greatest favor. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. We have expanded your chest to receive the Quran. And this is the ultimate favor. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم سألت ربي مسألة وددت أني لم أسأله I asked Allah a question I wish I never asked him. قلت يا رب قد كانت قبلي رسل منهم من سخرت له الرياح ومنهم من كان يحي الموتى Oh my Lord, people came before me, prophets, that had the wind at their disposal and that used to give life to the dead. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is saying these miracles that the prophets that had before. يا رب, are you going to give me one of these miracles? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet Didn't I find you as an orphan? Didn't I find you in need? Didn't I find you seeking? Didn't I open your heart and remove your burden? Remember, ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى We did not reveal the Quran to deprive you. Allah directly correlates the descent of the Qur'an into the heart of the Prophet ﷺ with the removal of burden. Because as heavy as the Qur'an is, it is shifa wa rahmah. It's mercy, it's a cure. So the, we opened your heart to receive the Qur'an and we removed thereby your burden sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is the greatest miracle that can be given to a person. So this is a theme. These two surahs came to the Prophet ﷺ together with the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Now as I said, sometimes you'll find two surahs that are different in the placement, especially in Juz Amma, from the timing they came together. And there's another theme now that we'll go to. And that is, uh, so we finished vision, affirmation. This is the theme of motivation. What drives you is different from what drives them. What drives you is, what dif is different from what drives them. What is this speaking to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a series of surahs that speak to the motivation of the believers versus the motivation of the disbelievers. Specifically, what Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu would say, abna dunya wa abna al-akhirah, the children of this world and the children of the hereafter. What drives you both? And what's the difference in how this is going to play out in your reception to this revelation? And Aisha radiallahu anha has a beautiful you know, hadith in this regard, a beautiful narration in this regard. She says, if the first revelation to come down was, don't commit adultery, the people would have said, we can't stop committing adultery. And if the first revelation to come down would have been, la tashrabu al-khamr, don't drink alcohol, the people would have said, we can't give up alcohol. But instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spends 13 years revealing about Allah and the hereafter. Allah and the hereafter. Allah and the hereafter. Allah wal yawm al-akhir. Allah wal yawm al-akhir. Surah al-Mufassal the small surahs that solidified the hearts of the people so that by the time Allah then revealed the revelations, give up alcohol, give up adultery, 
they responded in an appropriate fashion. Now here's a question for you, all right? And this shows you the, the, the profound nature of the revelation in this regard. The Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, anhu, let's just take him for an example. Did they commit a, did they used to worship idols or drink alcohol or commit these major sins? None of them. And there is a class of Sahaba that fit a mold of nobility even prior to Islam. It's a small class of companions with the Prophet ﷺ. Amongst them Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, right? They never even used to do those things before Islam and they won't do them after Islam. All right? But, What's profound here is that Allah and the hereafter speak to the heart of the repenter and speak to the heart of the worshiper and bring them to the next level in equal proportion. What do I mean by that? The same verses about Allah and the day of judgment can cause someone to stop sin and cause someone to worship harder because they speak to motivations, underlying motivations. So if you are sinning, or you're already striving in good, those verses are going to land in a certain way that'll make you do more. They'll bring you to the next level. So the way that it's landing and resonating with Abu Bakr and Uthman is different than the way that it's landing with someone who's still struggling to overcome a sin. But it is causing them to strive for something greater. Strive for the hereafter, not for this world. And so two surahs that actually came down were Surah Al-Layl and Surah Al-Fajr. They're not together in the Mus'haf, but they actually were revealed together, almost in succession, and they have a beautiful tie-in. Now I want you to just look at the function of language for a moment. وَالضُّحَى وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Allah describes the lifeless night, a life without revelation, in Surah Al-Duha, where the Prophet ﷺ is looking and waiting for revelation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى The night as it covers. The night as it covers. What is Allah referring to here? The usage of language. The facade of this world covers the reality of the hereafter. The facade of this world covers the reality of the hereafter. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah Al-Fajr. Wal-Fajri wal-Ayalin Ashr wal-Shaf'i wal-Watr wal-Layli idha yasr. The night as it departs. So, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَسْرِ The night as it departs. And if you look at the theme of the surah, it is speaking to the world departing with all of the opportunities that you had to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the cover is being pulled. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَسْرِ And Surah Al-Fajr. You see the difference? So, Surah Al-Duha, the night is still. Surah Al-Layl, the night is concealing the hereafter. Surah Al-Fajr, the cover is being pulled. Wal-Layli ila yasr. Now let's look at these two surahs and how they spoke to Seerah. Surah Al-Layl was revealed in regards to one companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Does anyone know who that is? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Remember we talked about motivations. Why? Abu Bakr was hard to figure out from the wealthy and rich Meccans. Most of those that followed the Prophet ﷺ were the weak and the downtrodden. Abu Bakr anhu was wealthy, he had everything, and particularly they didn't understand why he was spending so much money freeing people from slavery. And the types of people that he was freeing, right? So his enemies were completely bewildered by, they just didn't get, why is he spending so much money here? Why is he freeing all of these people from slavery and then not asking anything in return from them. It doesn't make sense. So they started to come up with all these conspiracies, theories. Oh, you know, him and Bilal had a history, radiallahu anhum. They had a history. He owed Bilal radiallahu anhu something. Oh, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, you know, his cousin did something to him one day. He's got to f make up for something his cousin did. Because the Arabs had a sense of like loyalty and like, you know, wafa. So he's got to make up something there. There's something else going on here. A previous debt some sort of tie-in. Because he can't just be doing this for the Akhirah. There's no way he's just doing this to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't get that concept. They don't even believe in the Akhirah. Right? These people believe when you die, it's done. So they really like took, you only live once to an extreme. You've got to get it all out now because there's no such thing as a hereafter to them. So this idea of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu depositing his wealth himself into the hereafter doesn't make sense to them. So they come up with wild theories about him. 
And even the father of Abu Bakr, Abu Quhafa, he says to him, Ya Abu Nay, oh my son, people free people that can benefit them. You're freeing people with this high amount of money and you're not asking anything in return from them. And he said, Ya Abi, inni la arju ma Allah. I don't want what people want in this world, I want what's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how does the end of Surah Al-Layl come? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَيُجَنَّبُهَا الْأَتْقَى الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ يَتَزَكَّى وَمَا لِأَحَدٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ تُجْزَى إِلَّا بِتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No one can satisfy this person who spends for my sake except for me and I will please him. He's seeking a reward from Allah and I'm going to give him that reward. Right? Now go to the next surah that came down with it. Again, not in the Mus'haf together, but they were revealed together, Surah Al-Fajr. The night departs, the cover is pulled. What is this speaking about? Surah Al-Fajr starts to give you the image of a person who failed to, to prepare themselves for that moment. So as it all comes apart, they say, Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. Oh, how I wish I would have prepared for my life. And they're talking about the afterlife because it's like this previous life is gone now. I wish I prepared for my true life. Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. Fayawma idhin la yu'adhibu adhabahu ahad. Wala yuthiqu wathaqahu ahad. Ya ayyatuha nafsul mutla'inna. Allah says on that day, those people are going to be punished in a way that they never would have anticipated. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to who? The person, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى I will please him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O soul at peace, اِرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً Come back to your Lord, pleased and well-pleasing. You see, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى In Surah Al-Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will please him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the image of the death of a righteous man. Come back to your Lord, pleased and pleasing. فَدُخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَدُخُلِي جَنَّتِي Enter you into my paradise, enter you amongst my servants. So Surah Al-Layl, again, Abu Bakr versus those who don't prepare for the hereafter, Surah Al-Fajr, the final result, with identical words of Ridha. And the only person, subhanAllah, who's different is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know why? Because is he satisfied with his own salvation? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He's not. He's not satisfied with his own salvation. He's seeking something greater. So look at the words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى That the righteous man who works for the hereafter will be pleased. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Allah will give you until you are pleased. What is Allah speaking about? Saved souls. Saved souls. This is a result of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam crying, Ummati, Ummati, what about my Ummah, what about my Ummah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending through Jibreel alayhi salam said, نُرْضِيكَ ummatik. We will please you with your ummah. You will intercede on their behalf. We will not displease you. So he's not simply pleased, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, with his own soul coming out and being guaranteed paradise. He's only pleased when he brings as many people to paradise with him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this is one theme with two surahs that came down. Another two surahs that came down um, that people often don't connect is Surah Al-Asr and Surah Al-Adiyat. Surah Al-Asr, Surah Al-Adiyat. You know the surah about time that everyone reads when they don't have time? <laughs> that surah. Surah Al-Asr and Surah Al-Adiyat. These two surahs are profoundly connected. Now I'm going to be very honest, and this is just an observation. I'm not projecting on anyone, inshallah, in this regard. But Surah Al-Adiyat is a hard surah to understand if you don't know the tafsir of it. Right? Like, and you don't immediately, even if you speak Arabic, by the way, it sounds beautiful. But what's it talking about? It's an image where Allah is talking about galloping, beautiful Arabian horses. Horses that you admire when you look at them, horses that you can use in battle, that can penetrate deep into the ranks. Horses that the elite of society would collect and marvel at, right? So think about fine cars, except they also use them for violence, right? They use them for war. So the most beautiful horses were also the most potent ones for war. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is striking up the imagery of people and their obsession with something material. 
and then how they use that material for tulian, for aggression. So their pleasures and their aggression all coming together, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al insana li rabbihi lakanud. How ungrateful you are to your Lord. Wa inna hu ala dhalika la shaheed. And you know you're ungrateful. Wa inna hu li hubbi al khayri la shadeed. And your materialistic love is violent. It's just too much. You will kill each other over this world and kill each other using this material world. Will they not realize when they are spit out from their graves? So think of the image of people being spit out of their graves. And then the secrets of the heart coming out. So the bodies coming out from the graves with nothing of the world that they took with them to those graves. Any of the horses, any of the cars. <coughs> you know, subhanAllah, I was thinking about it. I was watching an interview with, uh, with Elon Musk. And he was uh, talking about his wealth and just marveling at it. I thought to myself, subhanAllah, when that man dies, the poorest man in the world and him will have the exact same bank account in the grave from a worldly perspective. He can't make a call. He can't you know, invoke any of his wealth. Nothing. You go underground. And it's profound when you think about the richest and the poorest person and then you're... Poof, right in the grave. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember, <sighs> they're spit out of their graves. And then the only content that matters is what's going to be pulled out of the heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an image, right? Then a surah that came down with al-adiyat was, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ What have you gained? By time as it is going, Verily, man is at loss. Except for those who believed and worked righteousness and were united and enjoining one another in good and forbidding evil, keeping each other patient. So what's the connection between these two surahs? So obviously, loss and gain, right? Taking the most precious gain and then putting it in perspective of what true uh, wins and losses look like. But also, uh, as a scholar say, that people of righteousness cooperate in good rather than people that cooperate in aggression. Because remember, they were using these horses also to attack and to be aggressive. And they enjoined one another in patience, restricting themselves, rather than people who push themselves towards their desires. Right. So it's literally the opposite two groups of people. Children of this world versus the children of the hereafter. So these, these two surahs <coughs> also profoundly came down together. Theme four, so we got two more themes, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the first three themes, just to repeat, vision, affirmation, motivation. And I'm going to give this one a, a, a rhyming uh, scheme, inshallah ta'ala, inspiration. All right? So vision, affirmation, motivation, inspiration. And this is through the lives of the prophets before. The way that the stories of the prophets then start to descend upon the Prophet Sallallahu in a particular fashion that suits his unfolding mission. Now, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, we give you these stories لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُعَادَ because we make your heart firm, we, we make you steadfast through these stories. This gives you a sense of steadfastness when you hear about the stories of the prophets that came before you. And the first prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a story to the Prophet about was not Musa alayhi salam or Isa alayhi salam or Ibrahim alayhi salam. It was Yunus alayhi salam, Jonah. The first prophet, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ إِذْ نَادَى وَهُوَ مَكْذُومٌ Be patient with your Lord. Do not be like the companion of the whale when he called out to his Lord as he was already swallowed. Now Allah did not say, don't be like Yunus, because that would be insulting to Yunus A.S. And the Prophet A.S. said, لا يقول أن أحدكم أنا خير من Yunus ibn Matta. No one should say, I'm better than Yunus ibn Matta. An amazing Prophet of Allah. But don't be like him in that moment. Don't be like Yunus when he turned away from his people and then called out to his Lord from the belly of the whale. That's not where you want to end up with this mission. So that's the first thing Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu about a Prophet before him. That this is going to be hard, don't walk away from it. So I'm telling you first and foremost, don't walk away. 
You stay this mission exactly as I command you to do so. And subhanAllah, this is a lesson if you realize, being on Allah's time, you're on Allah's timeline. The revelation comes to you when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees the revelation to come to you. And victories unfold as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides it. If you come to peace with being on Allah's time, you come to peace with everything else. That's why people give up on dua, right? Du'a to making dua, it's not coming. You're on Allah's time. So the first thing is, don't walk away. I might put you through this for 20 years. You might be in this for 50 years. You might be in it for 80 years. Stay the course. That's your first command. Qum fa'andir, stand up and warn until I tell you to not warn anymore. That's a message to the Prophet ﷺ about Yunus Islam. Then what's the next surah that comes with all sorts of prophets in a very particular connotation? Surah Maryam actually is the first whole surah that is revealed with the names of multiple prophets in a very particular context. How do we know? Because when the Prophet ﷺ sent the early Muslims to Abyssinia, what did Ja'far anhu recite to a Najashi? Surah Maryam, which is a proof of the, 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 uh, the early nature of its revelation to the Prophet ﷺ. And you go from Yunus السلام, calling out to Allah from the belly of the whale after having left his people to Zakaria السلام, ذكر رحمتي ربك عبده زكريا Zakaria السلام, in the corner of Masjid Al-Aqsa making dua to Allah. So you go from Yunus making dua in the belly of a whale to Zakaria السلام, making dua in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Specifically for what? وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي I'm afraid, I don't see prophets after me, I don't see predecessors, I don't see anyone that's going to carry this mission amongst my people. Earnestly worried, khiftul mawali, aw khaffatul mawali, in another qira'a. I don't see, I see it's gotten light, I don't see people here, I don't see prophets. What do I do? Who's going to carry the mission forward? So earnestly concerned with the da'wah to his people, and the succession of the da'wah to his people. Then Allah turns to Maryam alayhi salam. When after a life of praise, She's going to be slandered. But don't worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has you. Then Allah turns to Isa alayhi salam. And before Allah tells us anything more about Isa alayhi salam, Allah gives us the image of Isa alayhi salam speaking miraculously from the cradle, the first da'wah from Isa alayhi salam, speaking as a baby to his people miraculously. Then Allah gives us Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Ibrahim. By the way, all I'm doing is I'm going in Surah Maryam. If you're like, wait, where is this? You're losing me? Just read Surah Maryam. Then Allah goes to Ibrahim and what's the first mention of Ibrahim before building the Kaaba, before all of those stories? Giving da'wah to his father perfectly. So Isa giving da'wah miraculously from the cradle. And then Ibrahim speaking perfectly to his father with the da'wah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves to Musa alayhi salam. And before Allah tells us anything about Musa alayhi salam and the staff and all these things, وَجَعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about وَنَادَيْنَاهُ مِنْ جَانِبِ الطُورِ الْأَيْمَنِ that we called him from Tur and he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Harun and we gave him Harun as a prophet. What's the significance? Why did Musa want Harun to be a prophet? So he could help him give da'wah to Fir'aun better. So the concern of da'wah, حَمُّ الدَّعْوَةِ And by the way, uh, the scholars say no person ever did a greater favor for someone else than Musa for Harun, he became a prophet by the dua of his brother. That's an amazing favor that Musa did for Harun. Make my brother a prophet as well. But why, do, why make my brother a prophet? Primarily, I need someone to help me give da'wah to Fir'aun. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us Ismail alayhi salam doing da'wah to his family, establishing the prayer with his small group of people and being satisfied with that. Then Allah gives us Idris alayhi salam. وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّ Who even if no one accepts your da'wah, Allah has raised you to a high degree. So it starts with Yunus making dua in the belly of a whale, then a snapshot, a quick image of Zakaria making dua in the corner of Al-Aqsa, then a snapshot of Isa Islam giving da'wah from the cradle, then a snapshot of Ibrahim Islam giving da'wah to his father, then Musa Islam saying, Ya Allah, give me Harun to give da'wah to Fir'aun, then Ismail Islam teaching his family how to pray, and then Idris entering into Jannah and being given a high reward. What's the point of all of this? Qum fa'andir, stand up and warn. This is what that looked like in these various contexts. 
SubhanAllah, imagine how powerful, profound, that this is the way the prophets are introduced to the Prophet in the capacity of and stand up and call the people. And by the way, even if you call them as miraculously as Isa from the cradle or as perfectly as Ibrahim to his father, if their hearts are not prepared, they're not going to receive it. It's not about you. It's about them. Your, your message is good. Your methodology is good. You focus on that part. But just like your heart had to be made ready for the Qur'an, they have to have willing hearts for the Qur'an. And if they don't want the, they don't want the message, they're not going to receive it. Their hearts are not going to be able to receive this message. SubhanAllah, after that, the next set of surahs, Taha, Al-Shu'ara, Al-Qasas. Taha, and then Al-Shu'ara, and Al-Qasas. All of them revolve around which Prophet primarily? Musa alayhi salam. Taha, Al-Shu'ara, Al-Qasas. Taha is Allah initiating communication with Musa alayhi salam, taking it back to the beginning. Initiating contact with Musa alayhi salam. And making him a Prophet, and giving him the mission to go to Fir'aun. Al-Shu'ara takes you to the refined miracles of Musa alayhi salam, performing those miracles in front of Fir'aun and his people, and the magicians. Al-Qasas takes you to Musa's lowest moments, his hardest moments, where he's on the run and a fugitive and worried about being killed. What does that tell you? It tells you that the seat of the Prophet has taken a turn now. He demonstrated, he gave them miracles, and now he's being threatened by his people and run out and persecuted. So that's the element of Musa's life that starts to come out to the Prophet ﷺ in the early revelation to match those moments. And subhanAllah, almost all of the du'as, you know, you guys could Google and you say du'as of the Prophets. Almost every du'a of a Prophet in the Qur'an is revealed in Mecca. It's early Qur'an, especially the ones in desperation. The ones about establishment and succession are in Medina, because it matches the, the, the tune. But like Ayyub السلام, doesn't even come down in Madani Qur'an. The story of Ayyub is not revealed in Medina, it's revealed all in Mecca. The story of those prophets and their low points when they're most desperate is in Mecca, because that's what the Prophet السلام, needs at that moment. All right? The inspiration to continue forward. And then Allah gives him only one surah, where the entire surah is about the life of one prophet. Who is that? Yusuf You can't be sad if you read Surah Yusuf right. Surah Yusuf is incredible. It's incredible. And from start to finish, why is Yusuf Islam's life so relevant? Because his life parallels the life of the Prophet perfectly. Just like the brothers of Yusuf threw him into a well and set off this entire sequence of events, the brothers of Muhammad وسلم, his brothers in Mecca, the people that loved him and that knew him, and that knew everything good about him, they threw him away, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And that led to various circumstances. You know the most humiliating time for the Prophet? It's in Ta'if. Right? Shalohu bi thaman in bakhs. They mocked him, threw him away, like, get out of here. And he gets set on this journey, right? To where eventually, just as Yusuf alayhi salam will be on a throne in another land, be received by another group of people and be hoisted to the throne to have his brothers at his mercy, Rasulullah will one day come back and have those people that threw him out at his mercy. And what are the words the Prophet is going to use? I will say to you what my brother Yusuf said to his brothers. No blame on you today. May Allah forgive you. So the story of Yusuf is a start to finish parallel of the life of the Prophet Rejection to honor, slander to savior, it literally parallels every moment of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu mission. And you know what's beautiful about that? Yusuf saw a dream, right, in the beginning. The Surah Yusuf starts off with a dream, a dream of success, right? The vision was, I see the sun, the moon, the stars making sajda to me. My brothers, right, essentially making sajda to me. The same people that will try to kill me. What did Allah show the Prophet Sallallahu around the same time. Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj, the ascension. I want you to think about this, by the way, how amazing this is. On the night of Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has about 100 followers at that point in his life. It's been a rough decade, 100 followers. 
And now the Prophet وسلم, is high up there in the heavens and he is seeing وسلم, the ummas on the day of judgment, the nations, prophets with their nations. And he sees this massive ummah. And he says, Jibreel, is that mine? And Jibreel says, nope. And he turns to the Prophet وسلم, and he shows him an ummah that fills up the horizon of billions of people. And Jibreel says, that's your ummah. What? <laughs> SubhanAllah. I've got a hundred followers that are scattered and fractured and beaten up and persecuted between Mecca and Abyssinia. This is all my ummah? This is your dream. This is what you've got to keep in front of you. Because you need to know that after this life of tribulation, after the difficulty of this mission, this is what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with this ummah. Just like Yusuf Islam had to hold on to that dream of childhood, after this all passes, this is what you're ending up with. You need to know that you're ending up with this. And subhanAllah, this happens to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi nine years into his mission, and Allah reveals to him Surah Nuh. Nuh, who called upon Allah for 950 years. It might take 950 years, but you're only nine years in. Stay the course. <clears throat> this is your dream. It will happen. <clears throat> One of the things about Al-Isra and Mi'raj as well, <clears throat> is that how amazing is it that right after the Prophet ﷺ received the stories of the Prophets, he went and met them. Right? So you think about the timing of the events. The stories of the Prophets came down in Mecca during the most difficult times, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated the Prophet ﷺ and took him on a night journey <clears throat> where he got to meet the Prophets in the heavens. So you just receive revelation of them in the alleyways in Egypt and in the bottom of a well, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desperately, and now you're seeing them in the heavens. And they're greeting you and congratulating you and letting you know that one day you will join them and they pray behind you and celebrate you. SubhanAllah. Another connection here in these moments of Al-Isra'u and Mi'raj, specifically as it comes to, as it pertains to this, Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with two things that he had not gifted the Prophets before. Actually multiple things, but two things in particular that I want to highlight. Number one, the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah did not come down in that momentous way we talked about in the beginning. It was even more profound. Allah revealed the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah to the Prophet ﷺ in the heavens. All right? Now, think about that for a moment. What do the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah say? The messenger believes in what has come down to him from his Lord, and the believers believe too. They all believe in Allah, they all believe in the angels, they believe in the prophets, they believe in the books. Now here's the thing, this is being given to the Prophet while he's seeing the prophets, while he's seeing the angels, he's literally perceiving it وسلم, with his eyes, and Allah is giving him this verse. But Allah didn't just say, you believe, Allah said the believers believe as well. Why? Because what was the attitude of Abu Bakr عنه, when the Prophet وسلم, came back from Rasul and Mi'raj? If, if he said it, he's telling the truth. And so all of us see in that sense, that metaphorical sense, through the eyes of the Prophet وسلم, we believe because Rasulullah saw it. We believe him We believe in this reality as if we saw it. Because we trust our Messenger And we believe in the Book of Allah. And we believe in the methods by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the books and we believe in the reward that is promised within those books. And then a dua for takhfif, a dua for lightening the load. رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَعْنَا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْنَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتُ وَعَلَى لَذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِنَا Until the end of it. So Allah gave him that. Another thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that he has not given to anyone before. What do you say when hardship strikes you? Someone just say a curse word? No one said a curse word. What do you say when hardship hits you? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. How come Ayyub didn't say that? How come Ya'qub didn't say that? Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, لَوْ عَلِمَ يَعْقُوبُ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ If Ya'qub knew the words, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ He would have spent the entire 21 years saying it. If he knew the power of those words. But these are gifts Allah gives to this ummah. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ A dua that sums up, to Allah we belong and to Allah we return. 
to Allah, we belong to Allah, we return. So Allah gave the Prophet and the Ummah gifts to keep them going through these different uh, trials and tribulations. And then you see how Allah closes the loop in Mecca. So it all comes full circle, right? The first warning came, قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ O you who is wrapped up, stand up and warn the people. A decade has passed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to reveal to the Prophet وسلم, the mentions of Hud alayhi salam, the frequent mentions of the Prophet Hud alayhi salam. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Shayyabatni Hud wa akhawatuha. Hud and its sisters have given me gray hair. Hud distressed the Prophet وسلم, because the Prophet وسلم, understood that there is a finality here that's coming in the story of Hud alayhi salam. That, that it is essentially your final warning. Right? And that's why Allah reveals Surah Al-Ahqaf, the Surah of the Hills. You know what Ahqaf are? It's literally the image of Hud السلام, standing on the hills and say, saying to his people, look, the punishment's right behind me. You know when the Prophet وسلم, stood on Safa, the first call, he said, if I told you there was an army behind me, Hud السلام, is saying, this, this cloud formation you see in the skies, this is it. It's on its way now. وَيْلَكُمْ آمِنُوا Believe! And they reject Hud salam. And Allah starts to give us the last pleas, the pleas of the parents to their children, the pleas of the children to their parents, the pleas of families to families, believe. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will separate them. So it comes full circle in Mecca. It starts off with stand up and warn, and then a final warning. And the Prophet salam, makes his hijrah to al Madinah, and those who were left behind faced what they were left behind. The final theme here, so I said vision, affirmation, motivation, inspiration. Let's call this one triumph after tribulation. Triumph after tribulation. Because there's a, a beautiful connection here. It's not just victory. It's a very specific type of victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that true victory is when your vision remains intact. It's not just a material victory. It's not you dominating your enemies and getting revenge and vengeance on those people that hurt you. It's when the vision comes full circle for you, Ya Rasulullah. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so, what does the end look like? After Hudaybiyah, the peace treaty. Hudaybiyah, Allah referred to the peace treaty, which felt humiliating, Allah referred to it as victory. Why? Ibn Mas'ud anhu was saying to the second generation of Muslims, he said, you people think when you say al-Fatih, the conquest, you think of the triumph of the Prophet وسلم, walking back into Mecca with all of his followers and victory. But to us, when we said al-Fatih, it meant Hudaybiyah, it meant the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Why? Because Allah opened the doors of da'wah through that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave the believers, declared his pleasure and forgiveness for the believers in that moment. So this was the ultimate victory for them. This is what they were seeking. The da'wah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. We have clearly given you a victory. لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرْ وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَيَهْدِيَكَ صِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we have opened the doors for you. We have given you a great victory so that Allah will forgive you for that which came before and that which comes after. And Allah will complete his favor upon you. And what's the last verse that comes down in Al-Ma'idah? اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي I have completed my favor upon you. So here's the, the moment I'm telling you. The deen will be complete. The religion, the favor will be completed for you. This has now opened the pathways of da'wah. Your da'wah is going to go far and wide throughout the world and Allah will complete this favor upon you of this religion. Now I want you to think about this, not just the beautiful correlation between Surah Al-Fatih and then Surah Al-Ma'idah, which comes a year afterwards, when the, or, or, or later on when they make Hajjat Al-Wada' and they actually experience the conquest of Mecca and the, the wording here. Look at the attitude of the companions. When the Prophet وسلم, according to Anas عنه, he says when the Prophet وسلم, was returning from Hudaybiyah, the treaty, the Prophet ﷺ said that there was a verse, Unzila ta'ala alayya, ayah, 
there was a verse that was revealed to me. أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ That is more beloved to me than anything that the earth holds. They said, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? He said, لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَرَ Allah said to me that he wishes to forgive you for everything that came before and everything that came after. Look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. What did they say? They said, هَنِيًّا مَرِيًّا يَا نَبِيَ Allah." Congratulations, O Prophet of Allah. قَدْ بَيَّنَ اللَّهُ لَكَ مَاذَا يُفْعَلُ بِكَ Allah has shown you clearly what He intends to do with you. Like, we're happy for you. What an amazing gift to come to you. Allah's forgiveness descended upon you. Congratulations, Ya Rasulullah. But then they said, فَمَاذَا يُفْعَلُ بِنَا But what happens to us? What happens to us? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, لِيُدْخِلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to enter the believing men and the believing women into a paradise beneath which rivers flow. Then they all start to celebrate. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah is pleased with the believers when they took that pledge with you. So we all get forgiven too. We all get Jannah too. This was the culture of success amongst the companions. They understood at this point that even if no material victory was going to be achieved, true victory had already been achieved. Allah forgave them and they were promised paradise. After that, whether we end up in the bottom of a ditch in Surat Al-Buruj, set on fire, ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرُ That success, or we end up on top of the mountain again with material success, we already got what we wanted. We got the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is true victory. Now, subhanAllah, this verse that came down, Surat Al-Ma'idah, اليَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today I have completed my religion for you, and I have perfected the favor, أَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي and chosen for you Islam as your religion. This came after the Prophet ﷺ is able to now enter Mecca victoriously again, but it's beautiful because a Jewish man came to Umar anhu in his khilafah. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. He said, There is a verse in your book. If we, the Jews, had it, we would make it a holiday, we'd make it a ritual. Because the Jews were a very ritualistic people. So they said, You know, this verse would be like a celebrated holiday if it existed in the Torah. What an amazing verse that you Muslims have. And Umar anhu said, what is it? He said, That today I've completed and perfected my religion in favor upon you. And I've chosen for you Islam as your religion. And Umar anhu smiled. And he said, I remember when that verse came down. It was the day of Arafah, a day of Friday. And Hajj with the Prophet Basically, it is Eid for us. <laughs> it actually is. Because Arafah, Eid al-Adha, this is Eid for us. It does, it is commemorated. That was the verse that Allah revealed at that point to say, at this point, the legislation is complete. Yes, verses of the Quran, a few verses will come down after that, but they will no longer speak to legislation or the performance of the five pillars of Islam. All of this is complete now. You have your religion now. You have your full religion now. So, how do we close the loop on Medina the way we did in Mecca? One of the first surahs revealed in Medina was Surah Al-Saf, as a complete surah. Some surahs came down as complete surahs, some of them came down partially at times. Surah Al-Saf is one of the first surahs to come down in Medina. Surah At-Tawbah is the last full surah to come down in Medina. All right? Surah Al-Saf is the first surah to come down fully, or one of the first to come down in Medina. Surah At-Tawbah is the last full surah that comes down in Medina. What is Surah Al-Saf? Surah Al-Saf was now this new community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'alun. O you who believe, why do you say that which you don't do? Allah addresses the hypocrisy that's now starting to show in Medina. The hypocrites are pretending to be believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them, O you who claim to believe. Why do you say that which you don't do? كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ The worst thing in the sight of Allah is that you say that which you don't do. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفًّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْسُوسٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who fight together in ranks, one united body, one united body of Muslims. And they are sincere, striving for the sake of Allah together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the hypocrites and he celebrates the unified believers And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَصْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ 
The help, the victory of Allah will come, the help of Allah will come, and the victory will come soon. Nasr and Fatih. Does it sound familiar? Nasr and Fatih. They will come to you. Allah has promised this to you in the early days of Medina. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends off with what? Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, speaking to his disciples and asking, Who amongst you is really going to stay with me? Man ansari illallah. Who are my real ansar? Because the Prophet is in Medina, and right now the Ansar and the Munafiqeen are indistinguishable. They're going to be sorted out over the next decade in Medina. So Isa is speaking, saying, Man Ansari illallah. Who are my real Ansar? To his disciples. And subhanAllah, when I said that, when you read the Quran, whether you read it from front to back or you look at its chronological revelation, it's still miraculous. You know, the last time Isa is mentioned in the Quran, when you're reading from front to back, is Surah Saf. And what is he doing in Surah Saf? He's giving the glad tidings of a prophet to come after him. Of Muhammad وسلم, and he's speaking to his companions for the last time and then we never hear Isa's voice again in the Quran Surah Al-Saf it passes off all right Surah Al-Ma'idah is the last supper it's the feast and that's also chronologically the last moments revealed to the Prophet وسلم, about the life of Isa Islam Isa speaking to his companions for the very last time warning them of hypocrisy telling them to stay sincere, and celebrating amongst the sincere believers. SubhanAllah, a saf was a warning of hypocrisy and a promise of victory to the believers. A tawbah, which is the last full surah to come down in Medina, is a final warning to the hypocrites. Just like al-mudathir and al-ahqaf in Mecca, the first warning and the final warning, Medina, the first warning and promise, the final warning, and promise, and it gives them an opportunity. It's called Surah Tawbah. It gives them an opportunity to repent, to come back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in the last moments. Finally, how do you close the loop on this mission? You know, if you open a Mus'haf and you read the last pages, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ. Those two surahs go together, right? You read them together. The Prophet ﷺ frequently would read, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ in his salah, sunnah salah, and various sunnahs. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ was an early surah where you refuse to compromise on the oneness of God. Refuse to compromise on the oneness of God. Remember to Abu Lahab and their folks, this was a numbers game. All right? They said to the Prophet ﷺ, look, you know, how about you worship our gods one day, we'll worship your God one day. Let's make a deal, let's bargain. Prophet ﷺ says no. All right, a week to a day, no. The whole year, we'll worship just the law, just worship the idols for one day. Why? Because that gives us the, the necessary room to still be able to make some money off of them. Commerce, you validate them in that process. And even in the most vulnerable moments of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah says you can't compromise on this. They wish you'd compromise. What do lo tudhino fayudhinun? They wish you'd compromise. They'd happily compromise. They don't really believe in this nonsense. They don't actually believe in their religion, right? They wish they don't get you, but you cannot compromise. So it's negating all the idols and qulyai wal kafirun, and then qul hu Allah ahad is affirming the oneness of God, right? There are two surahs between qulyai wal kafirun and qul hu Allah ahad. What are they? Surah Al-Nasr and Surah Al-Masad. It's like footnotes in a way, subhanAllah, to the story. La ilaha is negation. There is no God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The negation part is Qul ya wal kafirun. The affirmation part is Qul hu Allah ahad. La ilaha illallah. The surahs match. And then in between is the story of the people that compromised, and the story of the people that refused to compromise. All right? So you have the humiliation of Abu Lahab, and you have the victory of the Prophet Now, chronologically speaking, Surah Al-Nasr obviously comes way later in the seerah. Everything else is early on in Mecca, right? But this is the missing piece that's going to be plugged in, your victory that comes with your vision. I told you this would happen, and now it's happening, Ya Rasulullah. Now, subhanAllah, this particular surah is so profound in when it was revealed. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, 
And I might miss my flight trying to tell you the story, but that's okay. Inshallah. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to honor Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. How old was Ibn Abbas? 16 years old. When Umar radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa and he was the scholar of the Ummah. And by the way, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu looked every bit of 16. He didn't look like a grown 16 year old. He actually, small stature, not much facial hair at the moment. Like he looked young, even as a 16 year old. And imagine the Sahaba line up to learn from him. And sometimes some of the elders didn't like it. They were kind of like, he's getting too much respect. So Umar radiallahu anhu recognized that and he wanted to humble them a bit. So he gathered all of them and he said, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصُّ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ What's the tafsir? And he goes around the room and he gets everyone to give their tafsir. And then Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma is asked, what's the tafsir? He said, this was the death announcement of the Prophet sallallahu this surah was Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ he's going to die. And Umar anhu said, that's why I listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. What is this referring to? Your mission as a messenger is complete, therefore your life on this earth is complete. Your mission as a messenger is complete, therefore your life as a messenger is complete. Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the help of Allah has come and the opening, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا And you see people from all over the world embracing Islam. SubhanAllah, Hajjat al This was revealed in the farewell Hajj of the Prophet ﷺ. Think of this image. Next time you do Umrah or Hajj. Rasulullah ﷺ is standing on Safa where Abu Lahab once humiliated him and everyone walked away from him and he stood there alone and wondering what just happened to me. And now he's standing on Safa and there are 120,000 Muslims that have come from around the world to do Hajj with him. Entire delegations of tribes, countries coming to take Shahada with the Prophet and embrace Islam with him and camping out around Medina to do Hajj with him from Medina. And the Prophet is looking out Safa, and he's seeing the sea of people. La ilaha illallah wahda, anjaza wahda, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al ahsaba wahda. La ilaha illallah, it was only one God the whole time. When he stood on that mountain and got rejected, he just said, La ilaha illallah. And now he's saying, La ilaha illallah wahda, affirming that one God, nasara abda, he supported his slave, just as he said he would. And he made his promise come true, just as he said he would. And alone Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did away with all of the enemies and replaced them with who? 120. Think about how enormous of a number that is in the seventh century. <laughs> That's a lot of people to be in one place in the seventh century. It's even more impressive than any display of Hajj that exists right now, even from a numbers perspective. They're all there for you, Ya Rasulullah. So what does Allah say? Now, declare the perfection of your Lord and seek forgiveness for your imperfections. That's the message, the call to action at the end of the surah. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates, she says that, I noticed the Prophet sallallahu suddenly, Araka tukthiru, Ya Rasulullah, Araka tukthiru min qawri subhanallahi wa bihamdihi astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. He, she said, I kept hearing the Prophet ﷺ say in his last days, he kept saying, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, so sabbih, declaring the perfection of Allah, and astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. I seek Allah's forgiveness and I repent to him. So she said, I said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, I see you keep repeating this now. What's going on? The Prophet ﷺ was known for his dhikr, but these two specific forms of dhikr, so he said, خَبَّرَنِي رَبِّي أَنِّي سَأَرَى عَلَامَةً فِي أُمَّتِي فَإِذَا رَأَيْتُهَا أَكْثَرْتُ مِنْ قَوْلِي سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبِحَمْدِهِ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ My Lord told me that I'm going to see a sign in my ummah and once I see it, I should say, سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبِحَمْدِهِ and أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ I should keep on repeating these two forms of dhikr. So he kept repeating it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the time of his death. Now realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَأَيْتَ nas, You will see the people embracing you. By the way, I'm finishing up here. Think about this for a moment. The power of vision. You saw the people mocking you. You saw the people spitting on you. You saw the people walk away from you. 
You saw the people hit you. You saw them literally knock your teeth out and try to drill your helmet into your head. You saw them murder your family. You saw every bit of that cruelty. And Allah said, فَسَتُبُصِرُ وَيُبُصِرُونَ Allah said to them in Mecca, one day you will see, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and one day you opponents of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will see. You will see. And now you're seeing them all embrace you. And what's the most powerful reflection of that sight that you see it come full circle, Ya Rasulullah? It is the last moments of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah, you know, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something that you, 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 like, if anyone's ever lost someone beloved to them, like, you can't, talk about the death of the Prophet ﷺ enough and not be moved every time because it's just so profound. Like this was our Messenger ﷺ, how badly we wished we got to be with him and to see him and how badly we wish we can be with him ﷺ. But there's something very specific about how he dies ﷺ that I want to point to inshallah in conclusion of this. You know when Allah says, that the believers say, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Our Lord grant us spouses and children from our offspring and make them the coolness of our eyes. Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah says, what this refers to, the coolness of your eyes, is not when you see your kids get married, not when you see them graduate, not when you see them finish anything worldly. He said it's actually when you see them in salah, when you see them in ibadah. You see them worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And especially the first time, and, and I share this, you know, parents who have experienced this and those who have not, may Allah allow you to experience it. The first time you go to wake your kid up for prayer and they're already up praying. The first time your kid actually says, let's go listen to a lecture together. The first time you see your kid reading Quran by themselves. The first time you see them utter an authentic expression of religiosity, the coolness of my eyes. That's what I want to see, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said his relationship to this ummah, I am to you like a father, I teach you. So what's that final moment of the Prophet ﷺ? Anas ibn Malik anhu says we were praying in Masjid al-Nabawi. And the Prophet ﷺ removed his curtain. And he looked at us praying and in that congregation in Medina, there were people that once insulted the Prophet ﷺ, people that tried to kill him, people that killed some of his loved ones, people that rejected him, people that mocked the idea of ever being Muslim, and they're all together praying Salah. And like the proud parent, Rasulullah ﷺ looks at them, فَتَبَسَّمَ He started laughing, ﷺ, joy. Like as if for that moment, the fever doesn't even matter. This is it. Just capture the moment. There they are in salah. Alhamdulillah. فَتَبَسَّمَ ضَاحِكَ وَكَانَ وَجْهَهُ وَرَقَةُ مُصْحَفِ And Anas who says, Wallahi, his face was as bright as a page of a mushaf. Like he was so happy. So happy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we got excited because we thought he was coming back out. And what's the last thing they saw from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Let's keep praying. Keep on salah. Go back to your prayer. Just focus. I'm happy to see you this way. His last message to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is this. Just keep praying. And then he closes the curtain, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's the last time we saw his face. SubhanAllah. Like a proud parent says, now I'm good. Now I see them. Alhamdulillah. My mission is complete. And then the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looks up to the skies and he now, in the lap of his wife, recites Qur'an to comfort himself. The Qur'an that once ran him to the embrace of Khadija, he's in the embrace of Aisha, and he's saying, He's reciting the verse, I want to be with the Prophets and those who Allah an'ama alayhim, Allah blessed, favored from the Prophets, from the Siddiqeen, from the truthful ones, from the martyrs, from the righteous ones, and what a beautiful companionship that is. And he longs for that companionship of the Most High, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he breathes his last in that fashion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a journey with the Book of Allah and what a journey of the people around the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with a messenger of Allah receiving the Book of Allah and how it all comes full circle. What I want to share with you all in conclusion is that everything from the Qur'an is directly relevant to a person in terms of their relationship with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But everything we spoke about today 
is only directly relevant to you if you've inherited the mission of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Because there are verses about da'wah, there are verses about calling to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi there are verses about living, being an extension of that message, that just won't resonate with you if you're only worried about your individual spirituality. This story is relevant to those who follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those who believe in him, and those who seek to be a part of his mission Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So fit yourself in that mission. And there is literally nothing of the Qur'an that won't be relevant to you in that process. And Imam Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that those that came before you, they used to read the Qur'an in a way that it was like Allah sent them personal letters. And so they would read them lovingly and contemplate at night with those letters, and then they would long for those letters during the day. So read the Qur'an that way. And SubhanAllah, I give you an experience uh, that many of you might find familiar in Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live to see Ramadan and allow us to be accepted in Ramadan. Have you ever been around someone who was deeply moved when the Qur'an was being recited and that moved you, the fact that they were moved? You saw someone else crying and it made you cry as well. The weeping of someone else made you weep. Even if you didn't even understand what made them weep. When the Prophet stood up and he stood on the minbar and he said, that Allah has given a choice to one of his servants between the life of this world and the life of the hereafter. And that servant chose the life of the hereafter. Abu Bakr anhu broke down and started weeping. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas anhu says, we were confused why Abu Bakr was crying so much. I mean, it was a pretty generic statement that the Prophet just gave. But the way Abu Bakr anhu cried confused us. And then he said, we all started to cry too. Not because we understood what the Prophet ﷺ had said, we were crying because of how earnestly Abu Bakr anhu was crying. Like it just forced everyone else to cry. And then we realized Abu Bakr anhu in that masjid was the only one who was able to catch that the Prophet ﷺ just said that he was going to die. He was talking about himself. He was the servant that had chosen the hereafter over this world. And only Abu Bakr anhu was attentive enough and his heart was in tune enough with what the Prophet ﷺ was saying that it immediately struck the Prophet, that it immediately struck his heart. That he just said he's going to die. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Two people can be reading the Qur'an, but it's about the attentiveness that you have to it. Now, Abdullah ibn Shaddad, rahimahullah, he said, I entered into the masjid one day and Umar ibn Khattab anhu, was leading the salah and he was reading Surah Yusuf in Al-Fajr and he said, I was in the last row in the masjid and he was reading, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحِزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ I complain of my grief and sorrow only to Allah. And he was crying so much. He said, I could hear his sobbing from the back row, the very back row of the masjid. And he kept repeating it and sobbing. Why was Umar sobbing? Was it because he was remembering the heart, hardship of the Prophet Was it because he was going through something? Was it because he was connecting to the story of Yaqub? Was it all of the above? Right? That's the beauty of connecting to the Quran. Connect to it through the lens of the Prophet وسلم, connect to it through the lens of the Prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an, and then situate yourself in it to where it becomes your own personal story. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he raised the Prophet وسلم, by the Qur'an, raise us with the Qur'an. Allah elevated the Prophet وسلم, made him the greatest, most honored person in history through this Qur'an, and Allah honors in this Ummah Ahlul Qur'an more than anyone else, the people of Qur'an. May Allah make us amongst them and forgive us for any shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove from us any veil between us and His Word and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khaira. I hate to be that guy that just bolts out after giving a lecture. I don't like doing this. Seriously, I don't like doing this, but please forgive me. Inshallah ta'ala, I'll be back inshallah ta'ala, and I'll get to meet you all uh, personally, but in the Ta'ala, but for now, I've got a flight to catch, inshallah ta'ala. So, Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can we get a round of applause for Shaykh Omar Sulaiman? Takbir! Takbir! Takbir!